This show opened up with a segment where, oh, first off, they had clips of Hogan doing his various media appearances this week. They called the show A New Beginning. How many new beginnings have we seen with TNA? How many have we seen with Vince Russo? How many did we see at WCW there at the end? About a dozen, right before they went out of business. So the show opens, I swear to God, with Dixie Carter speaking to all of the wrestlers in an empty impact zone before the show. She said a lot of people had told her how to run a wrestling company since she started seven years ago, and it was time for a change. She said she'd made a lot of changes in the past several months. There were many more to come. She said nobody liked change or drastic moves. And while she respected those that had differing opinions of decisions she was making, she was expecting all of the wrestlers to support her 100%. By the way, I presume that means that she respects me. I have a differing opinion. She said when you question things in this company, you question her. And she cannot allow that to happen. She said she'd made the choice to put her finances and passion behind all of them. It was time for them to do the same. They had a choice to make. They could support her in the direction TNA was going, or they could choose not to. And if they chose not to, they needed to find a new place to work. She said, no great success came without risk. Now's our time, she said, but this is a test. And everybody needed to step up in every way possible. Let's do this thing together, she said. And she said if the fans didn't believe that now was the time, they were hurting her and the fans. Very amazing statement here. I don't know why this aired on television. <laughs> I cannot fathom a good reason. I Let's think about what happened. They made what really probably is their biggest free agent signing in the history of the company. And then they aired this segment wherein the owner of the company acknowledged the fact that many of the people who work there are unhappy about the signing. Or, or wrestling in general in TNA. Or just the company in general. And she talked for a long time about how a lot of you think this is a bad move, or maybe you do. I've heard, you know, grumblings or whatever she said, but it was just, just pointing out that this move is controversial. Can you imagine, I don't even know you don't follow sports, Brian, but it, if one guy changed teams and they had a press conference wherein the new team said, maybe we shouldn't have signed this guy to all this money. Or if they made a movie... And they signed Johnny Depp to be in this movie. And the director said, a lot of people on this movie don't like working with Johnny Depp, but we're going to give it a go. That shit happens all the time, though. Does it? Yeah. I'm not, I'm not familiar with that. Interview with the vampire when they cast Tom Cruise as Lestat. This was a huge... People went crazy. Did the people making the movie go crazy? Anne Rice went crazy. She wrote the book. And then later she thought he did a great job, but regardless. <laughs> and this happens with signings. What about, like, Pac-Man Jones when he signs with the company? The, the people or the outside dog the fighter. The people outside the company tore him apart. The, the dog fight dude. The, the people w on the team. Yeah, on the team, no one publicly said anything bad. Huh. Well, clearly Dixie Carter doesn't run the place. I guess not. Or so, Vince Russo. I was just amazed by this, in in every way. They they kept panning the crowd, the shots of the wrestlers, and they were all sort of half paying attention. Look <laughs> like their Victor, uh, Tara and Rhino were sitting there. They had their hands, uh, their elbow on their knee, and their face resting in their palms, looked just bored out of their minds. Dixie sounded so nervous. Yes. And by the way, great, you've been running TNA for seven years on your dad's money. Right. What the fuck does that mean? What does that make you? She's been... That makes you, that makes you so all-knowing that nobody can question you? It's ridiculous. It was an odd segment. Then the real show started. AJ came out, talked about all these changes. Name dropped Hogan. Said he'd been dreaming that TNA would be at this level for the last seven years. What level have they achieved, by the way, with the Hogan signing? Uh, the same level with one more guy. Hmm. So he talked about this and that and talked about the mystery guy that had been jumping him every time he had his back turned and told that person to come out and man up. And Daniels came out and they argued back and forth because Daniels was upset that AJ thought that he could possibly have attacked him. And then he started burying AJ for always getting special treatment and this and that. And then Joe came out and said that Daniels was trying to work AJ and he was a liar and this and that. And Daniels was like, listen, if I, I don't need to attack AJ from behind. If I want his belt, I'll just take it. And AJ says, oh, yeah, yeah, uh huh? Well, let's do it tonight. 
And they shook hands, and Samoa Joe cackled and smiled, and that was the entire opening segment, and it went a really long time. It did. I liked it because it started off, the whole, who was sneaky attacking AJ Styles thing, that storyline is really dumb, and a really dumb way to build this pay-per-view. And by the end of it, Joe said, this is almost a direct quote, he wanted to be the best wrestler in the world, and to be the best wrestler in the, wrestler in the world, he had to be the TNA World Champion. And just like that, suddenly it was about guys wanting to be the best. He said that's why Joe said that's why he couldn't be friends with AJ. And Daniels said, I, "I if I was gonna, I wouldn't sneak attack him. I could just take AJ on by myself because I'm the best." And AJ said, "Oh yeah, I think I'm better than you." And they were all fighting, and it all made sense. And I uh, knocked Daniels' performance last week. I thought he Fool. was awesome here. Fool. He was awesome here. Yes, he was. All three guys actually were very, yeah. very great, but Daniels in particular was was fabulous. So this, this segment gets a hearty, hearty thumbs up. And they just gave away half the pay-per-view main event, for those keeping track. We had Eric Young and Big Rob Terry against Beer Money. And I was going to write that Rob looked okay, and then he immediately fucked up a backcracker. So, can't say that. Rude got out, tag, ran wild. I will say that Rob Terry misses less spots than Molina. So, yeah, that, he, is, yeah, he was, that is a plus. I compared him to the Warlord. That, uh, watching him move, there was a, and he, you could name any big, horrible stiff from the 1980s. I, I, but there's someone in particular here reminds me of I couldn't put, couldn't put my finger on it. But that being said, he didn't fuck up hardly anything. He just moves horribly. Like he'll do a forearm and he'll go and raise his forearm up and then drop it down and he'll do this big exaggerated Irish whips. And but yes, he did not like he he never fell down. He was never out of position for anything. He did drop Robert Roode on his face on a flapjack and almost kill him. But what can you do? They did trust him enough for Storm to take a backdrop over the top onto him. So That's true. That's saying something. So Eric Young, of course, gets the fucking Legends title. He brings in the ring right in front of the ref. The ref is looking right at him. Not at EQ. He accidentally hits his own partner, and then Beer Money wins. The usual, can we get an agent with a clue bullshit. And, and then afterwards, we had a run-in. We had the World Elite hitting the ring, and so we're keeping a running tally on the show. 1-1 in terms of post-match run-ins so far on this show. And by the way, after that, a bunch of geeks made the save, and as they were going up the ramp, the machine guns attacked World Elite. So actually, we're at 2-1 to one yes. as far as one match, two run-ins on this show. That is, that is the tally, and it, and it took forever, and it was a mess. The match was fine. It was obviously not very good, but it was fine, and then there was... A ton of bullshit afterwards that probably took as long as the match did. Beautiful Leo Black stage went into ODB's locker room. They all buried each other. ODB said she was filming a movie and they needed slut doubles, which the girls were excited to do. And then they got into a brawl. Pure shite. Just horrifyingly bad. There was something involving makeup and a bag here. This segment was completely hateable. They put her... You know when you buy a dress and you get the plastic bag that you zip up the dress into... I never bought they a dress, put ODB but okay. in that. First off, how's that even possible? I don't Second know. Second off, why? I don't know. This is this is the the Brian, I don't know. version of a body bag. <laughs> Perhaps it is. Hmm. They're, they're they're going to start putting girls in plain plastic bags now. Lauren was backstage with Jay Lethal, thrilled Hulk Hogan was coming to TNA. Said he was so excited that next week the Black Machismo Invitational began where he was going to face legends one by one. He name-dropped Jake Roberts, Honky, and Ric Flair. I would be thrilled to see Honky Talk Man versus Jay Lethal. I'm dead serious about that. Yeah, it probably happened, actually. Foley did an interview, and Borash claimed that he was excited that Hogan was coming in, which was funny because Eric Bischoff just did an interview talking about how he thought that Jeremy Borash sucked. Oops. That was funny. And Foley said he had a surprise for Abyss later. And more was to come. Nigel McWolferson against Cody Deaner. Nigel immediately pinned him with a lariat. This, oh my god. Just, again, you read the spoilers, everything sounds great. You actually see how they put this together, and you realize what incompetent boobs these people are. The idea of Nigel just coming out, killing a guy with a clothesline, and cutting a promo about Kurt Angle... Great. That's all great on paper. Nigel did a great job with it. The problem was, Nigel is coming down to the ring, and Kurt Angle, of course, got laid out last week. He's not at the show today. So what do they do? They call Kurt Angle on the telephone. In the middle of this match. The match has one move, a lariat. 
He is hitting the lariat as Angle is talking on the telephone. It's impossible to pay attention to all this at the same time. So then Nigel goes up on the ramp, and he starts cutting this promo, and Angle is talking over him on the phone. Yeah. Are you fucking kidding me? They Maybe they've never made a TV show before. Maybe they got all a new production right. staff this week. Maybe this was the first time they'd ever filmed a television program. The you best, certainly fucking think so watching this. That's the best explanation I have. Nigel then plugs the pay-per-view match between himself and Angle that, it, of course, had not been announced yet. So that was great. And then his catchphrase is that he's hungry like a wolf. No joke. Referencing a Duran Duran song from 25 years ago. No joke. Nigel would have been, what, six? That's like maybe younger? As soon as he said hungry, you literally said, don't say it. Yeah, I was horrified. Don't even, say even it. Even I, even I thought this would be a lame catchphrase for a wrestler in 2009. And he said it, it was just, oh, God. Yeah, that was horrible. Angle uh, was talking over him the entire time, and... He, he, oh, it gets better. Let me say one more thing. Not only is Nigel cutting a promo, and Angle is talking over him during the promo, but as both of these things are going on, they're stretching the dude out of the ring, and they're doing quick cutbacks, so you can barely even tell what's going on. Yes. This was the biggest fucking mess of a segment I've ever seen. Well, except for that... Or, or, I don't know. This may have been less messy than that double run we just talked about a few minutes no, ago. No, no. This was way worse. But this was way worse. Angle was trying to sell his neck injury by throwing in fake coughs every now and then. Which sounded completely horrible. And uh, then Nigel does his promo, hits his lame catchphrase, puts his sunglasses on, turns away. And, then, and by the way, since Angle was on the phone, Nigel couldn't hear him. Yeah. So he, even in storyline, he had no idea Kurt was talking. So Nigel puts on his sunglasses, turns his back, makes his big dramatic entrance. And Angle's like, nice glasses. <laughs> just, just killing everything. Of course. Lauren interviewed Suicide. Said homicide had revealed that he'd seen who he was without his mask on. And she wanted to know if it was time for him to reveal his identity. And he said, if I want to reveal my identity, I wouldn't have put a mask on. Fair enough. And then he said, I have a very good reason for wearing it. And then he said homicide was in trouble. What could possibly be the reason to put a mask on Frankie Kazarian? Because he's way more entertaining as suicide than he was as Frankie Kazarian? Is he? I think so. All right. That's my opinion. Yeah. I like him much more suicide than they ever did as Kazarian. All right. That's just, just one man's opinion. Take it or leave it. Lauren interviewed 3D. Bubba talked about Hogan. Said Dixie's decision to sign him showed she had the biggest balls around. Why? Why does it take balls to sign Hulk Hogan? <laughs> Perhaps because they're investing so heavily in him that she has put the company in jeopardy. Well, there is that. that, that I think that's a storyline. Oh, great. Great. So Rhino, Because, Brian, that's why she had a hell of a meeting saying, I know a lot of you think this was stupid, this was thing I would have done. Rhino walked up and said they may not believe him, but he was right. said last week TNA had found a way for them to lose. He said the bad call was not a mistake. And tonight, Morgan and Hernandez, the same two guys that have been trying to uh, take them out for weeks. I don't know, because I wrote an incomplete sentence. <laughs> <laughs> that's fine. Bubba told him he was crazy. That's all that matter. matters. Yeah, there's something here whining about a conspiracy theory, and Bubba said no, and then he said we're going to fight these guys, and they're good, but we'll beat them. Somebody on the board asked a very good question, and that was, why was AJ versus Daniels the semi-main, and Team 3D was the main? I don't have any earthly idea. Okay, that's a brilliant question, but let me, let me inform all of you that did not see the show that AJ and Daniels came out for their match at 9.49 p.m., 49 minutes into the show. Yeah. Why? This, after AJ had declared himself earlier, I am still TNA World Champion, and talked about how he was the most important guy in the company. Not 9, even the top, 49 p.m. Yeah, not even the top of the hour. No. 49 minutes into the show, they come out. <laughs> he came out right as whatever you were watching was going to the big finish. Sure. So before the match starts, a mystery man runs in, attacks AJ, and since Joe and Daniels are in the ring, that meant it was neither of them. So much for the mystery... <laughs> At least there was some intrigue that, that, that one of them may have been jumping AJ. You know what I mean? We're supposed to believe that, hey, maybe it is Daniels. No, not anymore. Mystery over. So the Joe in the ring booted Daniels in the stomach, gave him a muscle buster. That was the end of the segment. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Uh, it went two seconds. It was two guys laid out. Are we counting these as run-ins in our official tally? 
Well, no, it was, I, didn't count, I didn't count that as an actual match. All right. So then we had... And Nigel versus Cody didn't have a run-in, but it was a squash match. So we're, we're actually two matches, three run-ins, I believe. Okay. Tara versus Hamada. Match was sloppy. Someone on the board said they really enjoyed this, and I was like, in what way? It was they fine. They did not work well together no. at all. They botched some stuff. Tara finally got her knees up and then hit a widow's peak for the pin. And Kong ran out afterwards. Kong, everyone! And dudes tried to hold her back. Tara did a dive onto the post. So three matches and three run-ins, I believe we're at right now. I did like Hamada at one point using multiple headbutts. I just tried to imagine, imagine say, Kelly Kelly <laughs> running wild with headbutts in a Divas match. Mm-hmm. Strange. It worked for her, though. Tara and Hamada had a sloppy match, as noted. And then afterwards, we had Foley come out, do a promo, said he had a gift to Rooney for Abyss. Said the last time he brought out a photo, he cracked it over his skull, but this time he, he wasn't going to do that. And Abyss came out, and basically Foley just all of a sudden likes Abyss. He said... All, the, all that stuff I called you, I didn't mean it. All that stuff that we built up that pay-per-view for weeks, I was only joking. <laughs> you're actually really... I'm not making this up. No. You're really tough. You're better than I thought you were. Here's my gift to you. It was a caricature of the two of them that they showed on screen for literally a half a second. Way to go. And as Foley was leaving, Abyss... Or Foley told him, you have one more test to pass. Next week, Abyss versus Stevie. If Abyss wins, Stevie leaves the company. Abyss was so happy, and they Abyss actually turned the picture in such a way that it could be seen on camera. So at least Abyss has a clue. Abyss unlike has these, an idea of how this is supposed to work. Unlike these production dumb yes, shit. This was a bit, uh, Foley came out. He was talking about how he had to find out for himself just how good Abyss really was. That's why he laid him out and left him laying as bloody in a ring as any wrestler I've seen in years mm-hmm. to find out how good he was. Yeah. Abyss is cool with this. Then Foley said that he had uh, accused Abyss of being a Foley knockoff, but then he himself, Mick Foley, had always patterned himself as a cross between Bruiser Brody and the Dynamite Kid. Yeah. Not once have I ever looked at Mick Foley and said, that guy reminds me of Dynamite Kid. Now when he's doing a bunch of stupid stuff and destroying his body? I don't recall, well, <laughs> Dynamite Kid certainly destroyed his body. I don't... Uh, Maybe I didn't see Dynamite Kid doing Head a lot of stuff. Headbutts off the post to the cement floor. I didn't see Foley do that. I saw Foley. I, I most my Dynamite Kid watching was a Tiger Mask or in tag matches with the Bulldogs <laughs> in WWF. So somebody get Vince. Perhaps a, uh, I didn't miss Dynamite Kid doing even more stupid stuff than I recall. Somebody please get Vince a Dynamite Kid comp for the tape review. So then he said he also stole from Harley Race. He stole a lot from Terry Funk. And he basically told Abyss, it's cool that you're stealing from me, but you need to steal from other people too. Which is great. That's fine. And then they're just friends now. And he, they have a wacky... Uh, Foley presented him with a wacky cartoon. He said, this is to commemorate our match at Bound for Glory. Where, of course, they beat each other bloody again. And that was that. Signer did a promo. Talk about how Hogan was going to come in, put all the young guys in their place, and then join him in the main event mafia. He's the only one left. That is awesome. Because, again, he doesn't watch any of the segments he's not in, so he doesn't know they don't exist anymore. Yeah. That's his gimmick, and I love it. I absolutely love it. He buried Lashley, talked about how it was crystal clear that Crystal clearly wanted to fuck him. You cannot stop the lust of a woman, he said. <laughs> we need a Scott Steiner drop board like the Iron Sheik one on the iPhone. Matt Morgan promo saying Hogan coming to TNA was like the biggest news ever. We had Lashley and Homicide. I, I need to cut you off here. Morgan said when he was growing up, he idolized Hulk Hogan. And not, he said, Bill Cosby or Ralph Cramden. Yeah. Apparently Matt Morgan was born in the 40s. Lashley and Homicide. Crystal came out to the ring with her man. And as soon as she got there, Earl Hebner sent her backstage. Because, you know, she might help Bobby Lashley win. Sure. Bobby Lashley needs help with Homicide. Well, wrong. Well, as he saw, that was very wrong. So they're building up Homicide versus Suicide, so I have no idea why we saw Homicide versus Bobby Lashley. They're building up Homicide versus Suicide and Homicide versus Amazing Red. So Bobby Lashley kills Homicide dead right. quickly, Uh huh. and then Homicide attacks him afterwards, so there's another post-match deal there, and as Lashley's about to kill him, Steiner appears on the screen, literally with Crystal over his shoulder like a cave woman, and he's dragging her off into the night. 
So, Lashley, I swear, everybody, I know people think that I'm just fucking around when I do these reviews, but Steiner runs backstage. Lashley runs backstage? Lashley runs backstage to Steiner. He stops the kidnapping. He beats up Scott Steiner, and geeks pulled him apart. Geeks had to pull the baby face off the heel. Way to build the feud. <laughs> he got his revenge now. What? <laughs> he beat him up. He left him laying. This was something else. Everything on this show was something the, else. The, 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 everything about this segment. The homicide is being built up for the ex-title and a feud of the suicide, so they sent him out here to get killed by Lashley. There's no one else available to have Bobby Lashley be. It had to be homicide. Mm-hmm. So he kills him once. Then after the match, he killed him again so dismissively that he presses him over his head. That's when the video of standing up on the screen. And he stood there watching for a second, Lashley did, and then just dropped Homicide, who was dead, and went to make the save. So everyone remember that. The segment ended with Homicide being punked out twice in one segment. Oh, more. Uh, Red hit the ring after commercial, and he was beating up Homicide. So back to our stats. I believe I may have screwed something up. Four matches, five run-ins. I think so. I think so. And homi- that match also had two. And Homicide got beat up three times in, I guess, two segments here. Yeah. Way to sucks go. Sucks to be him. Way to go. That sucks to be him. Taylor Wilde and Madison Rain. The best part of this was Taylor standing in the middle of the ring and taking five steps to make it to the ropes. Yeah. You're supposed to run from <laughs> rope to rope in three steps. She took five to go halfway. I'm pretty sure Hornswoggle can make it across the ring in fewer steps than her. So, Taylor won in like 60 seconds. Rolling a verse cradle and a bridge. And then we had another run in. I didn't even write who it was. It was the beautiful people who attacked Taylor with a giant dildo. And then Srita made the save. So five matches, seven run ins. And then, of course, ODB ran in next. So we got five matches, eight run ins. Wow. That's amazing. We need angles. This is kidding. This is what makes this is what makes wrestling work is angles. Lots and lots of angles. Yeah. When in doubt, throw another body into the ring. Yeah, when in doubt, do an angle. Yeah. 20,000 buys, everybody. Month after month after month after month. Reiner did an interview, and, uh, I'm sorry, Morgan, and, Morgan Hernandez. and Hernandez. You really got to edit this report. Hernandez. And I was the one drinking. Needs to do a gimmick where he doesn't speak. That's all I got to say. And they, they really had nothing to say. No. For Russell, anyone, there is no conspiracy theory. Yeehaw. Daniels versus AJ. Joe is referee. That was awesome, by the way. Yeah, earlier we saw this man attack Chris Daniels from behind and lay him out, so they just sent him out there to be the referee again. Yeah. Why and not? Daniels is just out there. Why not? So they didn't show Daniels' entrance since they were running short on time because God knows they could not cut any of the 80,000 stupid skits on this show, all these angles. They had to... Uh, well, they had actually, to make room for Dixie laying down the law to the company. And they had, to, they had to cut out parts of a match. Apparently the taping report said this was a four-star match, so apparently it was massively edited. We did not see a four-star match here. It went about four minutes, I think. AJ comeback, Styles clash, one, two, three. Joe gave him the belt, raised his hand in victory. Hell of a match for a guy who was taken out in an ambulance last week. Then Joe left the ring and then ran back in. (laughs) He left the ring so he could run back in. We have to have a run-in in every match. So, Joe, leave and then run in. Yes. So, yeah. I didn't count it, though. We're at six matches, eight run-ins. And uh, for what we saw, it was virtually all. It was AJ selling his ribs from the sneak attack earlier and Daniel selling his neck from Joe laying him out. And so we didn't see them do much cool stuff, really. I cannot tell anybody apart from reading this report. Here I write, Homicide talked about Hulk. No, that's Hernandez. Stars, as far as the eye can see in TNA. Just recognizable stars. Oh, and by the way, Hernandez says, what's good for TNA is good for us. <laughs> he did say that, yes. That's what he said. Really? What's good for TNA is good for TNA? Never would have thought that one. Profound. Lauren interviewed Stevie about next week's match with Abyss. Daphne was there, but she's still too injured to work, which is fine because the original idea was Abyss versus Stevie and Daphne in a handicap match. So thank God she got hurt, taken out of that bullshit. And Stevie told Abyss he should back out now, otherwise he had no idea what was in store for him next week. A run-in! <laughs> I was very excited here to wrestle Abyss again. I just thought, hasn't Abyss physically killed you at every encounter you've had? Then we had the main event. 
Of course, the world fucking champion is followed by Team 3D against Morgan and Homicide. Team 3D, whatever. Team 3D is not even the the TNA Tag Team Champions. They're the IWGP Champions. And they're more important in the pecking order than AJ Styles. And you wonder why the guy's pissed off. So, they announce it's a non-title match with a 10-minute time limit. There's nine minutes left on the show. Dave Penzer, of all people, should know to just say, just say TV time remaining. So they have a match. Today's talking about how next week Super Dave melts, and then they kind of edited him, and he added Super Dave, whatever Dave's last name is. Osborne. Who the fuck cares? I did know, looked that up afterwards. Super Dave Osborne has been around for 30-some years now. Yeah. This is not, this is not Bob Barker. No. No, it is not. And, and to be fair, he, I guess he has a new show on Spike, so this may not be TNA's idea. He does have a new show, yeah. It does not help their show. No. Rhino came out to yell at Bubba. Bubba told him to bail. This was awesome because apparently, okay, the deal was Morgan and Hernandez were working over Devon Dudley's knee or ankle or something. To Rhino, this meant they were trying to end his career. <laughs> They were all they were doing was well, he's crazy. They were doing ankle holds and double teams. They they did not break a single Wait rule a second. in pro they, they they stood him on his head and then drop kicked his ankle. Come on now, you got to fight. That's trying to end a man's career. <laughs> but yes, as as in the foreground, Bubba Ray and Rhino were having an argument. In the background, we saw I think it was Hernandez, but one of them had Devon down on the ground and he lifted his ankle and held it in the air so that Devon was basically. Upside down, standing on his head. Getting a headstand, like I said. Yes, and then Morgan came in and threw a drop kick to the ankle. Thank you for repeating exactly it's what I said. so absurd, I needed to point it out detail by detail. That was ridiculous. So they so, do this match. I'm just going to move on here. You'll be talking all night. So they, they do they do this match here, and by the way, this is a question. Why were Hernandez and Morgan even getting this match when the Machine Guns beat 3D clean last week? One on two, in fact. Don't know. Don't know. Shouldn't Team 3D at least get a rematch if it was a bad call, supposedly? I... You know, they didn't even mention that bad call once in the show. No, the announcers. No, no. Anyone? I, no, Rhino did. Did he? Okay. Rhino flat out was talking about it. I wasn't paying attention. So, Bubba ran in. All of a sudden... There was just, no replay of the angle. In the middle of the match, Bubba goes outside and gets a chair, and then he just runs in and uses it for the DQ. <laughs> yeah. For no conceivable reason. <laughs> Literally, if, if in fact, Devon's leg was in danger of being ruined and his career ended, he could have tapped out. How? I just am trying to wonder how... I mean, does Russo actually think that, that fans are going to be concerned that Devon's career is going to end because he got his ankle drop kicked? I mean, what am I missing here? I don't, I Who lost. could possibly think that? Uh, a newborn could not be that concerned <laughs> about this. So Bubba runs in with chair shots, and then he looks remorseful. Then Rhino, their hated enemy, gets in the ring and gives him a hug. Bubba shoves him off. Rhino stays on him. Rhino gores Hernandez. Rhino gores Morgan. He says, this is how it's done. He raises Team 3D's hands in victory. Bubba buries his head in his hands. Devon puts his head down. Show ends. Show ends. I (laughs) could not believe... First of all, I couldn't believe this was the main event segment. But then the show ended that way, and this is, that's the end of the show? That's the end of the show? Yeah. What shit? Even the announcers were, were essentially saying, what the fuck was that? They all but said those exact words. And the show just ended. Did not this, go out on a high note. Maybe this looked great on paper. In execution, I don't know what happened. What? I don't know why we're supposed to care. <laughs> no. I have no idea what's going on. None. And I certainly do not care, which is worse. I'll tell you what I can't wait for. Hulk Hogan. Thank God Hulk Hogan's coming in. I Praise cannot, the Lord! I cannot wait for Hulk Hogan to come in. And you know what? I hope he brings in the booty man. And I hope he brings in Brian Knobs, mm-hmm. Nick Hogan, Brooke, Duggan. Bring in Brooke and put the woman's title on her. I Absolutely. Care. I do not give a fuck. I am begging for Hogan to come in. I cannot wait. I am so sick of this lame-ass, boring show. The same shit every week that makes no sense. Done with it. Bring in Hogan. Cannot wait for the new Hogan era. To the back. Let me tell you something, everybody. Dave is in the UK, 
And that means he's probably not going to be able to watch Impact. So you know what that means? You know who's going to be writing the Impact review in the Wrestling Observer Newsletter this week? Super Chico? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. And will I have some stuff to say? Will I ever? So this stupid-ass show opened up with um, a replay of Dixie's goofy speech last week. So they cut from that to Super Dave in Mick Foley's office. And they're just plugging the shit out of everything. And they plug the shit out of so much stuff that I actually thought they might plug some DX merchandise. <laughs> they didn't, but I was completely expecting it. So at the time, I thought, you know, this is like this is like the lowest rent ripoff of the raw guest host gimmick. It came off that way, didn't it? But I do have to say that by the end of the night, Super Dave had really grown on me. He, I, you know... I used to watch them all the time. I have not in many years, but I, I remember being wildly entertained by Super Dave. And he was entertaining here without actually killing himself, yeah. which is what usually the punchline to his jokes are. I think we need Super Dave to actually host Raw. And I was going to say do it right, but I got no faith in WWE doing anything right on Raw nowadays, so I won't say that. But Foley told Dave he could book one match, one match only. If it involved the knockouts, they had to dress appropriately. One match, one skit, he said. Yes, Super Dave is going to book a skit on Impact. You know, in Impact's defense, I thought that same thing, and then I think it was confusing. But I think that was, he was saying, you can book one match in exchange for having me in one skit on your show. I see. Hmm. It's not nearly as much fun as just saying you can book a skit. But I, I, I cannot uh, attack them without warrant. So Black Machismo, I can. Easily. Black Machismo showed up. Wanting to know where Hogan was, and he ranted and raved, and after he left, Dave said, Who is that guy? So another big star. It was actually even better. Impact. Super Dave didn't know who Jay Lethal was, and Jay Lethal didn't know who Super Dave was. Mm -hmm. They were just a bunch of geeks. So Borash wanted to know if Dave followed his tweets. Dave buried Twitter and went on and on. (laughs) And then it just goddamn long. Just ended. Welcome to Impact. Yeah. You know, God bless Jeremy Borash, but does like anybody in the world find this tweet? Ongoing gimmick funny at all? No. I can answer that. It's factually impossible for anyone to be amused by Jeremy Borash being fascinated by tweets. Hmm. Polly came out to do commentary for the opener, and this this was where, if I cared more, I'd be screaming right now. The opener, with a 10-minute time limit, by the way, was Dr. Stevie versus Abyss in a Stevie leaves town if he loses match. Yes. Swear to God. If Stevie loses this match, he has to leave Impact forever. It's the opener on Impact. It's got a 10-minute time limit. Better yet, Daphne is out there with Dr. Stevie. Now, for those of you that recall, Daphne broke her arm at the pay-per-view. Went through a table and broke her arm. Remember that? Mm Mm-hmm. Has she appeared on a single show with a cast on? Mm Mm-mm. Have they made a big deal at all about how in the middle of a match, a hardcore match, a competitor actually broke an arm? That's how violent this match is? No, if I would not hang out with you and edit your newsletter, I would not be aware. Yeah, it's amazing. I mean, the Chris Saban injury, they had to put that on TV. Because, I mean, seriously, how do you have a legit injury not aired on TV? That was the argument. Mm -hmm. And meanwhile, she breaks her arm, and they act like it never happened. Well, to be fair, since that episode of Impact, they've acted like the Saban injury never happened. This is an amazing television program in many ways. So they have this little match, and so, yes, as noted, it's got a 10 limit time limit, and match starts, and, of course, the announcers are talking about Hulk Hogan. See, when you mentioned that this is where you, you would be angry if you cared, it was revealed here that Mick Foley was not at the Dixie Carter meeting, and he was complaining about, uh, he said he was informed of Hogan's arrival, but he could have been better informed. I guess have they technically said what Dixie does? Because in storyline, Mick Foley is the executive shareholder, yeah. which is a nice way of saying owner. Yeah. Then Dixie comes along and starts running the ship. Yeah. Well, she's the majority shareholder. I guess so. Yeah. I don't know. So anyway, it doesn't matter. I just kept waiting and waiting and waiting for them to just bring up this Stevie Leaves Town stipulation on commentary. But they didn't. No. I don't think they made a single mention of it in the entire match. So Abyss hits the black hole slam, and then the lights go out. When they come back on, Abyss is down. Stevie covers him for the pin. Stevie then gets a chair to do further damage. 
Poli makes a save. So, by the way, we're at one match, one run-in. So then the lights go out again, and they come back on, and Raven is in the ring. Raven, in 2009. The lights go out again, and uh, there's a flash. Apparently he threw a fireball at... Uh, at somebody, I, my notes are all fucked up here. But anyway, I think uh, it was Foley. Taz starts screaming about how Raven. He goes, "Raven is back in TNA," and I thought, "Looks that way, doesn't it?" And it was a complete clusterfuck. Yes. Yeah. And then after commercial, I might add, Raven, Stevie, and Daphne are all doing a promo backstage, and Stevie is ranting and raving about how there's no way he was going to leave TNA forever. You know, the stipulation they didn't bother mentioning almost at all. And uh, then Raven did this wacky promo where here in 2009 in TNA, he name dropped Tommy Dreamer and ranted, raved, abyss, abusive childhoods. Then he said he wasn't a serial killer, but maybe he was, he said, and he just hadn't been caught yet. I didn't like any of this. <laughs> I'll it be was, honest with you. I thought this was bad television. It was not entertaining. No, the best part was, well, I don't know what was the best part. Taz was far more impressed that Raven had returned to TNA, then the fact that Mick Foley had been lit on fire. Mm -hmm. Raven's return was a bigger news story to Taz mm -hmm. than burned flesh. Sure, why not? Foley gets burned all the time. I guess so. So, yes. And then they, they came out and they, they did the promo afterwards. And uh, as you noted, Raven was talking about Tommy Dreamer and Terry Funk. He said that was the last time he was involved with Cactus Jack. That was in 1996. Mm hmm. That was 13 years ago. I wrote down 12. I did my math wrong. It was 13 years ago. Mm -hmm. This is the, the, the story of this. And then he said he and Abyss were, and this is his exact words, like two old men sitting on a park bench. <laughs> he said, we are old men. Yeah. No, they're like old men. Sitting on a park bench reminiscing about old times. Let's move on. There's nothing more that can be said about this segment, Vince. I'm sure of it. I got nothing. They said Sting was going to talk next week about what he thought of Hogan coming to TNA. I could have sworn they said he was going to do that this week, but it got switched. We had Alyssa Flash and Tracy, and this was something else. This was stupid. Alyssa comes out, and she wrestles Tracy, and she starts working over her right arm. Working over a body part. And Tanae's like, you know, you guys might not know this, but Tracy had this... She's had a... Uh, she didn't want this mentioned on TV, but Tracy has had, uh, she's been handicapped, her right arm. Her hand, her right arm has been handicapped since birth, I believe he said. And I thought, well, that's nice you mentioned on TV, even though she didn't want that mentioned ever. So Alyssa works over the arm, works over the arm, and then puts her in an arm bar for the submission. And it's just like, it's just amazing to see, like, this match. Two women having, like, Kind of a Japanese style match, working over a body part, finishing with a Fujiwara arm bar in the middle of a show that just saw the preceding complete and utter bullshit. It was like surreal, just in the twilight zone. This segment was. So yeah, and then afterwards, for like absolutely no good reason, Tracy beat her up afterwards after losing. <laughs> it was really amazing. Tracy because, had to get her no heat back. I like to say it was really amazing because the, you know. Frank Tanae casually mentions this birth effect that Tracy allegedly had to her right arm and shoulder or whatever. And Taz is like, really? I didn't know that. And then he talks about how Alyssa Flash is targeting the bad arm. And he said, this is crossing the line. <laughs> he suggested that Alyssa Flash was committing some sort of moral offense by attacking a body part. Like it was her fault Tracy has a bad arm. So she works over the arm with perfectly legal tactics, holds, and strikes. She applies a horrible Fujiwara armbar for the finish. People in the crowd is like, what the fuck was this we just saw? Then Tracy afterwards beat her up and cursed a lot, and the crowd booed vociferously. Well, duh! <laughs> you <laughs> just you're... got beaten savagely and then sneak attacked her. <laughs> you could say, well done, TNA. Oh, well done, TNA. <laughs> I think, I'm not sure, I think Tracy was supposed to be a babyface. You'd never know watching this. Or maybe she was a heel. She was yelling at the people when she came out. So I guess this was a heel versus heel scientific match where one of the heels was sympathetic because she was handicapped since birth. And they broke no rules. <laughs> this place this is... This show! This place is awesome. This show! Then we had Jay Lethal. <laughs> this show! Jay Lethal had challenged any legend to a match. Eight of them came out. <laughs> They were all in Jim Neidhart's belly. Yes. I think he ate Vader. He's really fat, everyone. He is. We're sitting there watching this show, and they, they, we knew it was Jim Neidhart. They showed his pink and white boots before the commercial, so we knew he was coming out here. He came out, and I just bellowed. 
You, you screamed. You know the noise that we have the drop of? It's from the Kennedy match where I just go, oh, for a long time. Yes. I did it again. I could not believe how fat this guy was. It gets better. He's got this giant protruding stomach just hanging over his pants. And he throws one backdrop, the first move of the match, mind you. And the crowd chants, you've still got it. <laughs> Their standards are so low. I've never said these words before, but I would love to have a match in the Impact Zone. <laughs> this is the easiest crowd I've ever seen. And I've worked in Portland. Think about that. Yeah. I thought that was the easiest crowd in the history of the world. No. These people are even easier. So he doesn't still have it, everybody. He Let's lost be honest. It. It's gone. They had a horrendous match. They missed every spot that's ever been made in pro wrestling. And then Anvil suddenly just gives him a short power slam for the pin. This was the most unintentionally hilarious <laughs> impact segment I cackled in a long ass time. Jim Neidhart in 2009, in his impact debut, pinned Jay Lethal clean. Not just his debut, his one and only match, I believe. His one and only match. I'm sure he's gone forever. This was amazing. This is the story of the Jay Lethal Challenging Legend segments. He's going to lose to old men every week. Yeah. And this is supposed to make us care and get him over. Yeah. It's going to build to something big, Vince. That's what they say. There was a spot here where... These people don't have any idea what they're doing. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know what happened or whose fault this was, but there was an Irish whip, and I think it was supposed to be reversed, but it wasn't, or something. But the end result was Jay Lethal, all, I don't know, 180 pounds of him, whipping 700 pounds of Jim Neidhart across the ring. Yeah. Let me tell you something. WWE can no longer claim that Big Show is the world's largest athlete. Jim Neidhart has to weigh more than him. <laughs> So this, this was bad. This, I, I, it was, I was shocked at Jim Neidhart's physical condition. I was appalled by the match. <laughs> I was in tears, laughing at the finish. And then <laughs> Jim Neidhart had the audacity on national television to pull his straps down. Yeah. <laughs> wow. I don't know what to say. Perhaps Natalia is going to have a little brother soon because he looks like he's going to give birth. Lauren interviewed Lashley. This was awesome, by the way. They explained to us that this was taped earlier in the day. So, basically, Lashley is doing this interview. And while he's talking, a guy runs up and says, we've got an emergency in the truck, and we need you right away. And I'm thinking, an emergency in the truck, you say? Does he need, does he need to help you edit something? I was going to say, did the machine eat a tape? You and put you them back together? Lashley do pry the machine. Lashley's the only one who knows how to properly color balance the cameras. <laughs> The fuck do you... So there's an emergency in the truck. So he runs in there, and in the truck, there's a videotape of Scott Steiner that is magically just playing. Apparently, Scott Steiner has commandeered a satellite truck with a live feed, taken it into the lobby of a hotel. He's cutting a promo that is being broadcast back to the impact zone, hoping that they'll all find Bobby Lashley in time to hear what he's saying. Now, I'm, I'm just trying to think... Because when, when, when Lashley finally gets there, Steiner is talking about how, you know, it was smart that you didn't bring your woman to the impact zone. I know she's here at this hotel, and essentially I'm going to go get her. And I'm thinking, so what did Scott Steiner say for like the first 15 minutes when they went to find Bobby Lashley as this live thing is playing? So anyway, these are the questions that pop into my mind. So Lashley grabs someone's keys. He jumps in a car. He zooms out. The cameramen are all running after him. It's a, it's a, an emergency situation. Everybody's panicking. There are screams. Anyway, this angle is so important that they waited till 33 minutes into the show to show us this footage from earlier in the day. Yes. This was awesome. And, and of course, we actually had to see Lashley and the camera who get in the cars and peel off in the parking lot. Because, you see, Scott Steiner was trying to rape Bobby Lashley's wife. But it was far more important to get through that Jay Lethal, Jim the Anvil, Neidhart match yes. before we show the well, footage of this. I, that too. But also, it just goes back to, these are wrestlers. They are not stuntmen. Oh, yeah. The old Bret Hart thing. But no, we had to watch them. At least it wasn't icy. Bus. It was not icy out. It was a nice, clear Florida day. It was just dumb. Dave? Who's Dave? Oh, Super Dave. <laughs> <laughs> For a second, I thought Batista had done a run-in. I was like, am I, have I lost my mind to this degree? So Dave meets with Br uh, Batista. Super Dave Borash. Batista. Oh, Christ. Anyway, Take a deep breath, Brian. Regarding Slow Foley, down. Dave says, and I quote, looks like his face was burned. <laughs> and he says, maybe we should go check him out. And Borash is like, no, we need to run the show. And Dave says, we? 
And he says, he's in charge right now. He wants Borash to go make the best match possible with the craziest stars. And Borash says, well, that must be the X Division. And so Dave says, okay, I want you to go make that match. I want it next. So, of course, next we have the Beautiful People and Kong versus ODB, Tara, Sarita, and Taylor Wilde. They announced that Kong would be in a cage match with Tara at the pay-per-view. Why the fuck not? Madison, who looks like she's got new boobs, is in there half the time. It's horrible. They put Lacey in the ring with Sarita, a complete disaster. ODB gets a tag, breaks down, falls apart. Kong finally tags in and pins Taylor with the implant buster. Taylor, of course, won half of the tag team champions. So anyway, does this lead to Kong getting a tag team title shot? No. Of course not. This leads to Kong versus Tara in a steel cage match at the pay per view. And not even the, and the the loss in this you know the overall since Team A beat Team B, you would think beautiful people get a tag team title shot. No, no. It's Why just... is it in a cage? Well, you know what? I didn't even realize until you mentioned this that the match was official for the pay-per-view or that it was in a cage. It, so, is, it is in a, a cage match. Whatever. I, I would just, it was, was Kong fleeing at some point that I missed? No, absolutely not. Because it looked not. like she just got in the ring here and beat the shit out of people. Well, it was, I just laughed because, you know, you have Velvet, Sky, Madison Raid, Lacey, Von Eric, and Awesome Kong. Brian, who would you say is the best worker among those four? Hmm. Kong? I would say so, too. She did not tag in until the very end. <laughs> they had a story to tell that was more important. And then she tagged in and won in like a minute. Um, she usually wears great big giant kickboxing gloves or something. She didn't have them on here. Maybe she figured, I'm only wrestling for a minute. I'm not wearing the stupid gloves. I don't know. But, yeah. And then and then Kong pinning a women's tag team champion leads to her versus Tara, I guess, in a cage. And uh, nothing else. Super Dave told the X Division uh, that they needed to kill themselves. His exact words were, for their match tonight, kill yourself. Do what I do for a living. Risk your life. Hmm. So they all agreed. <laughs> yes, they the, the all agreed, we will go kill each other. For you, Dave. For, for you, Dave. The, well, the, it's for, they're doing it tonight for full. To honor Mick, they said. But yes, the opposing teams in the six-man match agreed to kill each other. Mm -hmm. All right. And all I know is at the end of this segment... Super Dave called Bashir an asswipe. Yeah, it's true. I laughed uproariously when I heard that. That was his exact word. That words. was when I turned on him. He was, <laughs> he was a also way. a good 10 inches taller than any of these X Division geeks, too. Angle did a promo saying that Hogan partnering with Dixie was going to be the most amazing thing wrestling had seen since the late 90s, he yes. said. Yes, he, he talked about, he said he had had the honor to, uh, the honor, the honor to wrestle Hulk Hogan before, and he said Hogan, who he called Terry at one point, mm -hmm. He knew what to do before, during, and after a match. Mm -hmm. I see. He basically said he's a good worker. No shit. He said Vince McMahon had created a monster. Hogan and Dixie Carter would create another monster. Then he said he wasn't talking about Hogan. He was talking about Hogan, quote, not even as a talent. Yeah. Insider. We got the rest of the Lashley footage. You know, the stuff that had been taped earlier in the day. They aired it 56 minutes into the show. Lashley rushes into the hotel, goes to her room. He runs inside, and it's a swerve. She's fine. So then, of course, there's another swerve. Steiner attacks him from behind, and attack is too strong a term. He waved a pipe at him. He he placed a metal pipe on his body repeatedly, yes. and, and Crystal screamed. And as he left, he told Crystal to check it out because her baby had his eyes. That was a good line. That was a great line. But, yes, this was the, the fakest attack Scott Steiner has ever been involved in. Well, you don't really want to beat up Bobby Lashley because this he'll is fine. fuck you up. Well, that... And but I, I would rather have this be fake looking than be real and have someone get hurt. But how you don't use a pipe? You just I don't know. <laughs> or, or get a fake pipe? Is that too hard? Mm -hmm. I guess so. That's your answer. So Angle did a promo talking about how the most important match of his career might be on Sunday. Oh yeah, he's talking about this. I swear to the Lord above, I had no idea who he was wrestling on Sunday. Well, something's I could wrong not, with for you. The life of me, think about this. Even I remember this. It's Nigel. Talked about various guys, AJ Styles. He goes, guys like AJ, they've really taken me to the limit recently. And I thought, really? You had him beat when the time limit expired. So he claimed he was in traction for three days after Nigel hit him with a lariat, said he was going to end his career at the pay-per-view. And then Wolfie ends up on the big screen in an obviously pre-taped segment. And it, I was sitting here thinking, this is the most low-rent thing I've ever seen, because they're both talking over each other. But as it turns out, that's part of the storyline, because it was a tape, and Nigel was in the ring. He had another brawl with Angle. He laid him out yet again, and 
I was over this the first time he laid him out. He's now laid him out three times. He said three times is a charm. And he also cut a promo where he said that he wasn't there to beat Angle. And then he added, Matt Morgan can do that. And I thought, no, in fact, Matt Morgan can't do that. Remember, because Kurt Angle beat when that him happened. as well. Anyway, he uh, said third time's a charm, sunshine, and that was that. Uh, yeah, it was just, just the scene of Nigel on the big screen cutting his promo and Angle talking over him saying, can you hear me, you idiot? I was like, no, Kurt, you're the idiot. Mm-hmm. He clearly, Even if this was live, it would have, should have been clear by then that he cannot hear you. So I guess the story was that when he saw Nigel was not reacting to him, in Kurt's mind, that proved this was taped, and therefore Nigel must be behind him, because he caught him off guard, you see, mm. and he got the better of the brawl at, to be in with until Nigel cut him off and won. So then there, there's the promo, yeah, where, where you see uh, Nigel cut a promo later saying he would finish the job at turning point. Last week, he said he was hungry like a wolf, <laughs> and I moaned. They trumped themselves when he said Kurt Angle would bow to his howl. <laughs> He really said that, everybody. Yeah. I'm merely reporting a fact on that. I refuse to comment. Super Dave came out to do commentary for the next match, and it was Red Machine Guns against Kiyoshi Homicide and the Mad Sheik, and they plugged his show more, and it went a minute, and then Homicide tried to hit the ring with a barbed wire bat. So they carted him away, which meant it was now two-on-three advantage babyfaces. Mike Tanay explicitly pointed this out, by the way. Fantastic show. So Red got our tag, ran wild, wiped out Kiyoshi. Saban did, I think, one high spot in the match just to be protected. And then Shelly hit a big splash for the pin. Don West out there as a cheerleader. Never even let him cut a promo. This was a good match. And I got to say that Super Day was actually awesome in, in putting over the baby faces in this he, battle. He had been being a wacky character all night long, plugging his own show, making jokes, and being a goofball. And then in this match, Red got the hot tag. And made his awesome comeback, and suddenly Dave just started marking out. He was going crazy about Amazing Red. And, well, it was a hell of a comeback. So, yes, this this worked out great. Team 3D and their new best friend Rhino came out and cut a promo about this and that. And, anyway, long story short, Hernandez and Morgan came out. And Team 3D had challenged them to a six-man at the pay-per-view and wanted to know if they had a partner. And Morgan said they didn't need one. They could do a two-on-three. So, stupid baby faces as usual. And then suddenly, out came the Pope, D'Angelo De Niro, dressed to the fucking nines. And for no conceivable reason, he's a babyface now. And he cut a promo, had everybody going absolutely nuts. He came off as by far the biggest star in this entire show. And he is going to be the partner of Hernandez and uh, Matt Morgan against Team 3D and Rhino, who are friends again, by the way, yeah. on uh, Sunday. Last week, the show ended in the main event slot, you recall, with Team 3D being... Reluctant or guilty about their actions and, and sort of forming a tenuous relationship, uh, alliance with Rhino. And they came out here and they're all just buds. Yeah. So there you go. And, and yes, uh, Morgan. I like the line where Bubba's like, Rhino's had our back for the last 15 years. And I thought, really? I, I could have sworn you guys had a blood feud like three weeks ago. Haven't you all been goring and cheering each other for a while now? I don't know. I don't know either. So Why yes. do I care? They don't. Pope was awesome. Lauren was in charge of the segment that you lost your mind in, explaining that. For no reason, the British Invasion suspension has been lifted. They have a match with the Guns on Sunday. If they lose to Beer Money tonight, Beer Money will be added to the tag match Sunday, and it will become a three-way. You got all that, everybody? And then Eric Young cut a promo, which was amazing. He was talking about how TNA didn't stand behind their suspension because they were weak. Yes. The suspension of his team. He found a way to bury TNA for lifting it. Well, that doesn't surprise me because uh, the British Invasion had pointed out this was a vacation for them. They yeah. didn't care. And putting them in this match meant they suddenly risked beer money being contenders again. Lifting this suspension was horrible hmm. for the British Invasion. So hmm. I don't blame Eric for being upset. And he said he was a fan of Hulk Hogan when he was three. Yes, because, you know, Hogan's old, everybody. He is old. He is old. Borash interviewed AJ about the match with Joe, which was coming up I believe, we may have missed something, but I believe this is the first time on the show that the main event of the pay-per-view in three days was plugged. Um, trying to think. I don't remember. Don't care. Borash interviews AJ, and he apologized to Daniels for thinking he might have attacked him, but he wasn't going to apologize for being the champion. Said he gave the match to Chris last week because everybody wanted it. 
was upset that Daniels was drinking the Kool-Aid. I'm so sick of that saying, by the way. Said, maybe. He, he goes, maybe. If, maybe Chris just wants my belt. Hmm. What a novel concept. You don't say. Chris Daniels may want to win the championship, you say. What a hmm. creative idea. Pretty good guess. He said he was sick of Joe's games, was going to play another game with him tonight in the pay-per-view, or in the uh, ring in the main event. AJ did not look happy, and uh, it's hard to blame him. <laughs> we'll talk about that in a second. We had Brutus Magnus and Doug Williams against Beer Money. This was, at least up to this point, best match on the show. Just a really fun TV tag match. All the old school spots. Storm made a hot tag, ran wild, four-way, hit the Beer Money suplex. Everybody went yay. And as it was going along, awesome. Beer Money suddenly stops, they grab a chair, they give the chair to the British Invasion, and they basically dare them to get DQ'd. Since if the British Invasion gets DQ'd, Beer Money ends up in the match on Sunday. I might be asking, well, why didn't Beer Money just beat them? Well, what happened was, British Invasion refused to use the chair, so Beer Money just hit their finisher and pinned them. Yeah. We had a chair just for the sake of having a stupid chair angle in the middle of this match. Other than that, everything was great. My, my, my note to read, match seems fine, but it is impossible to care. This was right after the promo. and uh, I like this match. This was a good match, everybody. I, you know what? You're probably right. You are probably right. I, I like three of these guys a lot, and Brutus Magnus usually can get by without screwing anything up. So I, I bet if I went back and watched this match, I would enjoy it more. But this is where I was just seeing red, because uh, not amazing red. Anger because of the the Thanks, Vince. Lauren promo, um, and 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 then in a match that seemed fine, Beer Money in the middle of their comeback, one they were running wild and hitting every move on earth and could do no wrong. That's when they decided to throw a chair into the ring and try to get hit with it and win by DQ. Stupid. Morgan and Hernandez asked the Pope why they should trust him, and he said he gave his word and it was golden. Yeah. All right. And he, and he explained that Team 3D and Rhino had vowed to hold the young guys down, and that was a direct quote, by the way. To hold the young guys down, and that included himself. Mm. So he was defending himself. It made sense. Daniels did a promo about the three-way at the pay-per-view, and he said that he and AJ would always be friends, but this was wrestling business, and that meant in the ring there was no family, there were no friends. He said he was every bit the wrestler AJ was. He would prove it on Sunday. It's a good promo. His delivery was great. It, it just again, he was saying there were no friends in the in the in the business because, well. There was no friends in the business because you know you're out there for yourself and it's winner take all, which begs the question of why the past month had to be built around our AJ and Chris friends. I couldn't just be AJ has a big shiny belt and Chris wants it. That's too difficult, Vince. Come on now. Then we had Joe versus AJ, and I will say that Samoa Joe has definitely dropped some weight. It's it's very noticeable now, and they had a good match, which of course went past the top of the hour because TNA randomly has like a five minute overrun. Like, some weeks it ends right on time, some weeks it goes over. So, I bet a lot of people miss the end of this match, which maybe is why people have given up on that final quarter, because they're annoyed. Anyway, they had a match here, and uh, and in the middle of the match, AJ goes up top for something, and Daniels jumps up on the apron in his street clothes. And AJ wants to know what he's doing, and Daniels says, and I quote, I'm watching your match. <laughs> that was awesome. <laughs> so, AJ punches him. Joe puts AJ in the rear naked choke. The ref stops it because AJ was unconscious. The fantastic title run of AJ Styles continues. Yes. I think his record is like now 1, 3, and 1 or something like that. Just fabulous. Yeah. And Daniel smirked on the uh, ramp. and Joe uh, smirked in the ring because now in the past week, like, I guess AJ beat Chris Daniels last week. Uh, Joe beat AJ this week. He choked out Daniels last week or, or something, but... The story here is that AJ and Daniels are geeks because they have lost matches, and only Joe is undefeated. So only Joe is a worthy champion of the three. You know, it used to be that you did, when you had a three-way for the main event of a pay-per-view. No more. Not no more. You'd have three guys all win. Now, most no. of them lose. So at this point, I just typed, I fucking hated this show. I, I typed that in all capital letters at the bottom of my notes. And I thought, you know, I want to remember this. So I copied it and pasted it to the top of my notes. I put it in giant letters. So it will be the first thing I see when we start the next week's show. And I remember, yes, I hated that show last week. I want to remember this hate. Angry man. Thumbs down. To the back. Vinny and I are going to run down the TNA pay-per-view here. and This was the best TNA pay-per-view in a long time. Number yeah. one. And number two, it could have been the best 
pay-per-view of the year from TNA or WWE had they not, early in the show, just fallen into the usual TNA trap of just too much stuff going on and overbooking. I, I did a, a, pre- a preview of the card in the Daily Update today, and I talked about all the matches, and on paper, this looked like an awesome show. And I said, well, I just hope they don't overbook this thing or, or do the usual TNA stuff and, and screw the whole thing up. But uh, luckily, they, they only did early on. The final two matches ended up being awesome, and so uh, a big thumbs up for the pay-per-view. All right, I got my report here, so we're going to look at this show from top to bottom. It uh, had an awesome opener, it had an awesome semi-main, and it had an awesome main. So anybody who's kind of trying to consider whether to spend thirty four ninety five on this show, I would say go for it. Not sure I would encourage anyone to spend forty four ninety five on it if that's what you have to pay for HD, but it's certainly worth the thirty four ninety five, and really probably worth the forty four ninety five as well. If I would have paid forty four ninety five, I would not have been upset with this show. I only paid thirty four, and so I really wasn't upset. But uh, recommendation to buy the replay of a TNA pay per view. It's not every day you hear that. In fact, lately it's almost never. But this harkened back to the days of old where TNA had. Really, really good pay-per-views nearly every time out. The opener was Red and Homicide for the X title. They just had a really, really good match. I expected this to be somewhere in the middle of the show, not get a lot of time, just a whirlwind of spots Mm -hmm. and that sort of thing. Instead, they gave them quite a bit of time, probably, I don't know, maybe 12, 15 minutes, somewhere around there. Homicide's doing the loose cannon gimmick. They just did a whole bunch of great spots. Red sold like a mother. Then he made a huge comeback, and the place went nuts. And Red ended up uh, shoving him off the top, hit a middle rope, code Red for the pin. My only problem with this match is, as happens sometimes in ROH and even Dragon Gate USA, for example, it hit a peak. The people were pissing themselves with joy. Then they had more moves to do, and they kept going, and they lost the crowd a bit. And then they kind of got him back into it, but the finish... The code red off the middle rope was kind of anticlimactic after all the stuff they'd done earlier. So I only gave it three and three-quarter stars. So (laughs) had it not had the uh, extra stuff, it probably would have been an easy four-star match. It was a a hell of an opener. And Don West was nearly weeping as he congratulated his man afterwards. And Don is the greatest manager, I think, in years. Well, he's the only manager in years. In forever, in fact. And what's so great about Don is he's actually pulling off the task of being a baby-faced manager for a mid-card guy. That's almost impossible, and somehow Don West is doing it. So this was two thumbs up. I think it's just because his enthusiasm is, well, first of all, I think it is sincere, but more importantly, it comes off as sincere. You believe he really is cheering for Red, and I believe he really does not know if Red's going to win. They may not smarten him up, but that's why Don West is so great. The match was really fun, mostly because, like yourself, I thought best case scenario for this, they might get four to five minutes of a nonstop motion and they would do them at the big spots and it would be over before you knew it. No, they were given time. And so they worked a nice, even pace. I often complain these extra division matches are hard to watch. This match was easy to watch. It gets an easy thumbs up and it was amazing because they just had two guys do a match. And yes, Don West was there, but outside of Homicide chasing at one point, he never really got involved. There was no post-match angle. There was no whose side is he on bullshit. It was just two wrestlers having a good match. That's all I asked for. ODB, Alyssa Flash, Madison Rain against the Beautiful People for the knockouts. Actually, Odie, why the hell did I get that? ODB and uh, Sarita and what's the blonde's name? Taylor Wilde. I always forget. Taylor Wilde, Sarita, and ODB against the Beautiful People with the knockout singles and tag titles all on the line. And... Of course, this was where we it just became TNA again. Yeah. The beautiful people come out, they turn their backs, they're about to bend over and show us their asses. When the director decides now is the perfect time to cut away to a shot of the metal ramp. I cannot make this up. He cut away to a shot of the metal ramp. Awesome. They get in the ring. They uh, worked over Velvet's vagina early. And this was one of those moments where I just take sage, such... Great joy in the fact that I can actually do this for a living. They work over her vagina. She uh, makes a tag. They get uh, Taylor in there. They cut her off. Lacey gets in there. There are chants of, you can't wrestle. Someone in the crowd has a sign that said, very creatively, Lacey Von Botch. Botch! I thought that sign was awesome. (laughs) It was awesome in its stupidity. 
They couldn't say, like, Lainey Von Eric or something like that? <laughs> Lacey Von Botch? Anyway, she was she was bad, but, I mean, I've seen... She's not as bad as I expect her to be. This entire match was... I give it a star and a half, but it was not as bad as I expected it to be. I expected it to be horrendous. It broke down, and it was six-way. Everybody was all over the place. And then all three heels end up in the ring with ODB. They're triple-teaming her. ODB then proceeds to beat the shit out of all three of them at the same time and pin Madison with a TKO. Awesome! <laughs> this match gets a thumbs up, even though it was only a star and a half. <laughs> and I may have been generous. It was very sloppy at points. Um, <laughs> in fact, it was started off sloppy, and then it broke down. And the beautiful people were working over ODB. It was ugly, it was sloppy, it was no good. And suddenly ODB started to come back, and the crowd went, went apeshit. So that part worked, and then she won. So this match, I will say this for this match, it ended at its peak. Yes. Which something to be cherished and was a rare event on the show, as a matter of fact. It kind of went downhill to a peak. It's amazing, really. We had Nigel doing a promo, talking about how this wolf was going to devour Kurt Angle. He uh, he said, are you down with the howl or whatever stupid catchphrase you is? You will and, bow to my howl. That's right, bow to the howl. But anyway, at the end, he called everybody wankers, and that saved the that, entire thing. He, he was doing a great delivery of really shitty material, and then he just turned to Jerry Borash and called him a wanker, and that redeemed everything. Yeah. He did have a, a a good line where he said he had studied Kurt his entire life. He knew Angle better than Angle knew himself, whereas Angle didn't know a thing about him. That was good. Unfortunately, no one else knew a thing about him either, and that kind of hurt their match, but I'll get into that later. British Invasion against Beer Money against the Motor City Machine Guns for the TNA Tag Team titles. This is a perfect example of a match where if you would have just put these three t- teams in the ring and just let them have a match, it would have been... Great. And in fact, for a while, that's what they did. It did. And it, it was. It started out really good. It kept going. It was a fun match. And all of a sudden, Eric Young comes down. And Eric Young attacks James Storm. And the referee is looking right at him. Now, I understand it's a three-way, and I guess you can't do a DQ, because then who wins? But it's so lame. So he attacks the guy right in front of the referee. And as stupid as that is, referee Earl Tubner just tells him to leave. He points to the back. Yeah. Go away. Really, Earl? What are you going to do? I mean, what are you going to do, Earl? And I was fact, hoping we'd find out, but we didn't. Well, in, in fact, Eric Young defied him. Yeah. He stayed there. He said, no, I'm not leaving. And so Earl Hebner just kept refing. Sure. It was a bluff. So Eric finally starts walking up the ramp. And who should come out but Kevin Nash, who has been feuding with Eric Young for the last several months over the Legends title. So Nash gets right in his face, he grabs the Legends title from him, and then, of course, it's a swerve. He hits James Storm with the belt. Because you see, Kevin Nash and Eric Young are now best friends, for those of you wondering. And, of course, that makes absolutely no sense, but it's a swerve, thank God. So the machine guns disappeared. I have no idea where they went. And the Brits double-teamed Robert Roode and pinned him. And, again, really good match, fell off a cliff. I give it three and a quarter. Would have given it more had they not done the bullshit at the end. Yeah, um, I, I emphasize the cliff more than the the first part. All I'm going to remember this in a month is Nash coming out and the and the crap with Eric and the machine guns just vanishing, perhaps via alien abduction. My my rating here actually says star and a half. Wow. The, yeah. The, the first part of this was really good. It was so good that when the two babyface tag teams were beating up the heel tag team two on one, the fans were into it because the moves were so cool. So maybe my, I, I don't know how to rate this shit anymore. It's, 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 I thought that many times. I, I, so yeah, I, I thought that actually a lot on the show. But if you like really good matches more than you hate bad booking, then you will give this a higher rating like Brian did. We had today saying that the doctors had told Foley not to head back to Impact until his facial burns had healed. And then today goes, he's ignoring the advice, uh, the advice he'll be on Impact Thursday. Way to go to make sure the angle doesn't get over. That was good. We had JB interviewing Nash about what he'd just done, and Nash said, Hulk knew, Hulk was in on it, and if Hulk gave it the okay, he'd tell us all on Thursday. Yippee. He said Hulk so many times here, I'm hoping he means the Incredible Hulk, or perhaps yeah. even BB Hulk. Tara and Awesome Kong in a cage match. Do not ask me why the first match of their feud is in a cage. I have absolutely no idea. It was pinfall submission or escape the cage. This was really weird because there were there were a couple of spots that were really cool. Like Kong was on the middle rope and 
Tara gave her a power bomb, and then there was a spot at the end where where Tara went to climb out, but then changed her mind at the top of the cage, as in every cage match, and did a Tez press off the top, a Tez press for the pin, and those spots were really cool. Rest of the match, bad. I don't know what it is, but when Tara was in WWE, I always thought she was one of the better women's wrestlers there. And for whatever reason, I'm impact. She's really bad. She's slow. She's everything looks phony. Stumbling, stumbling around. Her I don't punches know. look horrible. I have no idea what it is. It is odd. But anyway, they uh, afterwards she challenged ODB to a women's title shot, and I gave this a star and three quarter. There was some good stuff, and the rest of it was not good. I, I my theory on Tara is that it's the same thing as the Pride guys coming to UFC and having to learn how to work in a cage. She is used to the four sided ring. Now she has to learn how to use six sides. She's been there for a while now. Do you have a better theory? No. So, yes, there's also... Or she doesn't give a shit. That may, <laughs> that may be a better explanation. There's also Awesome Kong busting out a missile dropkick. Yes, Awesome Kong. That was cool. But, yeah, out, outside of the cool stuff, there was a lot of downtime. I went star and a half. Oh. Rhino and Team 3D against Hernandez, Matt Morgan, and the Pope. Now, this was another example of, if you just put these six guys in the ring... They'd have had a pretty damn good match. Instead, this match had to tell a story. And a stupid story at that. Yeah, that, that ordinarily, it's not a bad thing. Yeah. The story here was that Hernandez and Matt Morgan didn't trust the Pope. Okay. Normally, this would be a great story. Because the Pope was a heel, and he offered to join Matt Morgan and Hernandez. So, yes, they should question him. However, this is on a fucking show where, as we have seen on this show alone... Everybody is turned for absolutely no reason. So why does all of a sudden this have to have an explanation? Kevin Nash just became friends with Eric Young. No explanation whatsoever. Right on Team 3D in this very fucking match. In this very match. They're all of a sudden friends. They've been feuding forever. Why are they friends now? No explanation whatsoever. But the Pope. This has to be the major storyline here. Is the Pope going to turn? Is the Pope friends or not? So, of course, they had to do a, a spot where Team 3D was going to go for the 3D on Hernandez. But Pope made the save for Hernandez by tackling him out of the ring. He didn't attack Bubba or Devon. No. He attacked his own partner to save him. Yes. I had to watch this three times to figure <laughs> out what the hell this spot was supposed to it be. It was quite awesome because, think about this, everyone. You are watching your buddy just get to his feet, and behind him is Devon Dudley, and behind him is Bubba Ray Dudley. They're going to hit the 3D. There are three men here you can attack. Any of which will prevent the move. Do you choose A, Bubba Ray, B, Devon, or C, your friend? Pope chose C. So Hernandez rolled outside. He which was would tacked. be fine if it were obvious what were happening, but it wasn't. <laughs> yeah, it was. Yes, it was. Even even worse. Uh, even worse. His intentions were never clear. So he tackles Hernandez. Hernandez rolls outside and he was pissed. And I thought, I don't blame you. You just got attacked for no reason. See, here's one of the things on this show. I know they clue the announcers in, but. If the announcers would have immediately explained what happened, if he would have tackled his own partner and Tanae was like, he just saved his partner from the 3D, that would be fine. Instead, the announcers are like, what the hell happened there? And Taz is like, I don't know. Did he just tackle his own partner? So I had to rewind it twice. Yeah. Should not be happening on a pay-per-view. Poor, poor announcing. So anyway, it broke down in a six-way. Everyone hit a move. Morgan went outside. Pretended like he blew out his knee. Hernandez went for the border toss. Rhino hit Devon in the gut with a chair. At least the ref was distracted here. And then Rhino gored Hernandez for the pin. Two and three quarter, too much bullshit. There was. I, I will say that Bubba Ray Dudley was super entertaining this evening. Just uh, Even before the match, the heels are outside as the baby faces are entering the, enter the, entering the ring. And he sees the camera and he just walks up, puts himself in extreme close-up, and then walks away. And that was great. Then he started with the Pope. And- Actually, let me talk about this. <laughs> He gets in there, and him and the Pope are staring each other down. Bubba then gives him the fucking hardest shove you've ever seen and just knocks him right on his ass into the ropes. And Pope just sits there for a second, and then he rushes in, and he does a double leg takedown, and he just starts beating the shit out of Bubba, and Bubba rolls outside and pitches a fit, and then he turns to the camera, and his face is all busted up. And I thought, you know, we need to see more guys getting receipts on Bubba Ray for trying to be a bully. Bubba Ray tried to bully around a fucking guy who was an amateur boxer. Yes, a good one. Bubba then gets back into the ring and does the lightest lockup you've ever seen, and all of a sudden he's working like a total pro. It was tremendous 
everything about it was entertaining. Yes. And then he he uh, was working, but he he took over on 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 Pope for a while, and you know at this point he is busted up. He's bleeding from a, out like a, the the outside of his eye, and might as well make the most of it. So he turns to the camera, he opens his eyes wide, he grimaces, and he just holds up both fists, and he freezes there for a while. If you ever played Champions of the Galaxy, he looks just like the Creeper. He's a creeper. He was a creeper. Then he tagged out. So, thumbs up for him. And then later, he had to take a choke slam for Matt Morgan. And Bubba Ray, who was really fat, got way up for this move. He did. So, good for him. Lauren interviewed Steiner about the match with Lashley. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, she goes, This is now a no-DQ street fight. Yes, their first match of the feud. Mm -hmm. Now a no-DQ street fight. It always works that way. Because why not? Why not? Steiner cut a wacky promo. Said he was going to massacre Lashley and then massacre his wife. Actually, he said he well, was going to. No. He said he was going to take Lashley home and beat him up in his front yard. So I think he got confused and tried to save it. Didn't work, but it was funny. <laughs> it was great either way. Yeah. He said, "I'm going to cover you, then I'm going to cover your wife." Yeah. And one of you will be a loser, one will be a winner. And then he had to tell us who was going to be the winner. He had to make it clear. Lashley, you're not going to be the winner when I pin you. <laughs> Steiner and this Lashley. This is awesome. The Ste- DD promo. Steiner and Lashley, no DQ street fight. You know, I was I was down on this, and then after it was over, I gave it two and three quarter stars for two big scary guys. I mean, they beat the shit out of each other, and it scared the holy hell out of me because they they did like a top rope Frankensteiner spot that I don't think Lashley knew how to take because he almost killed himself. And Steiner almost died on the move. Yeah, and they're almost killing each other as they brawl backstage, and when it was over, I mean, it was it was a complete mess, but it was like kind of a fun mess. And I just thought, you know, if this had taken place entirely in the ring, this would not have been nearly this fun. Or someone would have died for sure. So the finish was they brawled backstage. And then after brawling backstage for a while, they just started walking back to the <laughs> ring. And I'm like, can we please, I've asked this so many times, can we please get some fucking agents that know what, they, what they're what they doing? These agents are just like, well, brawl backstage for a while, then go back to the announcer's booth. So they just start walking back to the announcer's booth slowly and then Steiner went up, and there's a scaffold, and he pulled a metal bar off of it, and he hit Lashley with it, and then he pinned him. <laughs> yeah. I I just presume that, that Lashley's done, and he's going to strike force, and that's why they rushed this into a street fight and beat him clean. If not, I have absolutely no explanation for what happened here. Well, there's always the possibility, possibility that they are just idiots. Oh, that's also true. Do right? not ever discount that. I did know when this was end. When, when this ended, I I know I I noted I defy you to name me a positive here aside from the fact that Scott Steiner survived. And in hindsight, that's a little harsh. He was throwing Lashley around with cool suplexes. There were moments here, but the first part of this match was they were just in the ring and Scott Steiner hit one thousand moves in a row. And occasionally they were cool like the suplexes. Occasionally they were scary like the Frankensteiner. Usually they were just moves. Then they went backstage. They brawled into darkness. They just disappeared from view for about 30 seconds. When they finally came back, Scott Steiner was just bleeding. How? Don't know. So they, they had Steiner uh, got suplexed through a table, which was the strongest table perhaps on earth, because it barely broke under the weight of the mass of Scott Steiner. Lastly, picked up a 2 by 4 Everyone in the crowd went, ho! Oh! Because you see, Hacksaw Duggan is still a bigger star than either of these two men. Lastly, he went for a spear, Steiner dodged. Lastly, goes through just wood. There was random wood back there, and the announcers were like, why is there wood there? Don't know. Perhaps it's a set or something. So Steiner grabs a cable, an electrical cable or something, and he chokes Lashley unconscious. He goes to the pin, and Lashley kicks out at two. And here is where Scott decides to be a good time to just walk back to the ring. Yeah. He has his opponent barely alive. He just, has just enough strength to kick out. Why not just keep choking him? Well, because, you know... Because it's time to walk back to the ring. Yeah. And then he hit him with a pipe and pinned him. Yeah. You know, this sucked. <laughs> Kurt Angle and Desmond Wolf. This did not suck. No. I gave at this any point. I gave this four stars. And I will say this. If this match would have been in front of an ROH crowd, this would have been an easy four and a half star match. Because the problem with this match is that I don't know if this is like they're not going in this direction anymore and this was the blow off of their short feud, but they like they worked it like an ROH match. So Nigel was was trying to set up all of his moves. He used the London Dungeon. He used the Tower of London. He used the Lariat. And the problem was that in front of this TNA crowd, nobody had any idea what these moves were. Mm -hmm. In fact, 
And you would think that, and I can't blame these guys for this one because the crowd should have known. They're in the fucking impact zone. It's the same people that go to every show. They should at least understand the lariat. But they're doing the match, and near the finish, Nigel hits the first lariat of the match, and the crowd reacted like he just hit a regular clothesline. It was nothing special about the near fall. The announcers went crazy, but the crowd was just like, he clotheslined him. Okay. So that was too bad. And then, of course, they traded all of their their uh, near falls and such, and, and the people just... Nigel has not been around enough. Um, and actually, I blame, I blame the people putting the matches together, because Nigel actually had a couple of squash matches on TV, and he should have used the London Dungeon. You would think. He should have used the Tower of London. You would think. He should have got some of these moves over before trying to do them in front of a new audience. So, anyway, I thought the match, you know, I really liked it, but to the fans, it wasn't quite as good. I mean, they were into it. They chanted, this is wrestling, after about 30 seconds, which actually pissed me off because we, it was were, 30 seconds. we were 30 seconds into the fucking match. Nigel did a cool arm ringer reversal. Great. Yeah. And uh, and then there were another group of guys where about 30 of them were yelling, wrestling! And another 30 went, yay! That was my new favorite chant ever. Yeah. Wrestling, yay! And by the way, what an awesome chant, this is wrestling. So what's the rest of the show? That should tell you something right there. Indeed it does. So, they had a really good match. Don't get me wrong. The match was awesome. It just would have been better if they'd gotten the holds over or if it had been in front of a different crowd. So, they did all their spots. They traded stuff at the end. Nigel used an Uma Plata, maybe for the first time in, in uh, wrestling history. He may have done an ROH. I didn't watch all of his matches, but switched back and forth. And, and Angle finally put him in an arm bar and then switched that into a triangle for the submission. And it was a hell of a match. Four stars. I couldn't be happier. Maybe you could say that Nigel should have gone over. Um, if he was going to lose, this is how it should be. But I have no idea where they're going. And they probably don't either, so well, who gives a fuck, really? But yeah, good yeah, match. Two yeah. thumbs up. <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm trying to figure out where they're going suddenly threw me off. I guess they're going to do Kurt and AJ next. But, yeah, no, the match was awesome. Uh, the, 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 uh, there was a point where they had already done the Tower of London and the Dungeon... And everything, and the and the ankle lock, and the angle slam. They had done everything, and they just started to repeat stuff because they had already done it all. And uh, it works in ROH sometimes. It even works in WWE sometimes. It does not work in front of TNA fans. Well, it would have worked if they would have understood what mm-hmm. they were doing. But by the third time he applies this arm hold, you may think, "Hey, I bet that move there hurts Kurt's arm." Why? It so, didn't work the first two times. I guess not. I, maybe you're right. But the, it, yeah, it was awesome. I went four and a quarter. Um, there, there were a lot of points, besides just not knowing the moves, the fans were also, there were times where they were just quiet, waiting for another big move to come. And, and that actually happened all, throughout the show, so not, not just this match, but it was awesome, and uh, again, if you were on the fence about buying, buying the pay-per-view, this, this match would be worth it. Then we had AJ, Daniels, and Joe for the TNA World title, a rematch of the best match in company history. I think I gave the original five stars. This was not five stars. And that's hardly a knock. This match was not five stars, everybody. I gave it four and a quarter. It's kind of funny because it's it's weird with some matches because when you watch this match from start to finish, it was like, Christ, that was an awesome match. Here we are 15 minutes later. I remember almost nothing about it because what it was was it was totally different from the angle match. Like, the angle match... I can remember almost start to finish everything they did because they told a much more simple story. It was, you know, Angle... Actually, first they did some mat wrestling early and Nigel did a bunch of old school British stuff. And then uh, Angle made his little uh, mat wrestling deal and then Nigel cut him off and worked over his shoulder and Kurt made a big comeback and they traded all of their finishing holds. And then finally Angle tapped him out with a uh, triangle off an ankle lock and an arm bar. I remember all this vividly. And then there's this match where I have, like, brief flashes of remembrance of some of the spots, but what it was was really one long three-way spot. And almost everything they tried, they hit perfectly. It was executed perfectly. It was a match where when you watch it live, you're like, holy shit, that was awesome. Now, a week from now, which match is going to stick with me more? The Angle-Nigel match, for sure. But I did give this three and a quarter stars. Uh, maybe you could even go three and a half, or I'm sorry, I give it four and a quarter. You could maybe go four and a half. It was uh, just an excellent match. Uh, AJ, uh, they did a spot at the end where, uh, let's see, Joe went for a muscle buster on Daniels. Daniels switched into the STO. I have to read this, by the way, because it's all a blur. It's pretty complicated. And 
Daniel switched into the STO, went for the BME, <laughs> hit it, but then AJ flew in with the springboard 450 under the pile, covered Joe for the pin. So AJ got out with his title, so that's his uh, reward for doing 8,000 jobs in a row on television. And not as good as 2005, like I said, but a hell of a main event. And again, two thumbs up, two awesome matches to uh, finish off the show. Yeah, there, there, are, there are points in this match where AJ Styles just looked like the best wrestler on earth, period. So he had a good night, and AJ on a good night is a fucking great wrestler. Uh, there were lots of uh, spots where they would do, like, uh, there would be two guys doing a spot. Like like Joe, for example, he hit AJ with a bunch of slaps and then finished him off with a enzigiri. So then he would try the same thing on Daniels, hit a bunch of slaps, and then he went for the enzigiri, and Daniels ducked it and hit something else. So they would do that kind of thing a lot, which makes sense, because it's a three-way, so you can set, set something up and then do a counter off it. So that was good. All that was all good stuff. There was a point in here, AJ hit his Fosbury flop dive, which he had not done in a long time, and he did a few other really cool moves, like a big, giant springboard Hurricane Rana, and the fans began to chant, Screw Hulk Hogan! Which... It's not his fault we don't get to see this kind of thing very often. If if Impact had wrestling like this all the time, I wouldn't hate it. Maybe they were just saying that we love Impact the way it is, so screw Hulk Hogan. But Impact's not like this. Well, that's true. So, I don't that's know. That's the one thing about this match also. I would actually almost go four and a half. Um, just because the one thing about this match is these three guys are all getting a little older and they're all getting a little smarter, especially AJ. I AJ's remember much smarter. I remember although, when I was sure AJ would be in a wheelchair in five years. Although I've seen, watched many times the animated gif of Joe doing that stupid dropkick in the Sting match. Well, he's gotten smarter since then. He has then. gotten much smarter since then. So anyway, they, they've all gotten a little smarter, and I think they're all a little more beaten up. But this was the night where they went back as best they could to 2005, and they were pulling out shit they hadn't done in years. So they worked their asses off, and I'm not taking anything away from them. It's just... It's one of those things where, you know, as as time moves on, a match that, you know, maybe if I went back and watched the 2005 match, it would be at the exact same level of this one. But it's now four years later, and we've seen all of this stuff a million times from a million different guys, and so, you know, I gave this, you know, four and a quarter. So it's objective, everybody. Don't yell at me. Two, just all you need to know is the last two matches were awesome, yeah. and the opener was fucking great. So uh, this is a, uh, it was a two thumbs up pay-per-view in my opinion. So get the replay. I can't remember the last time I said that. Somebody go back and, and tell me when the last time I said that about a TNA pay-per-view was. But this one was great. This was almost certainly the TNA pay-per-view, pay-per-view of the year. I'm pretty sure Desmond and Kurt had my favorite TNA match of the year. So yeah, this is pretty much an automatic thumbs up. To the back! All right, let's uh, let's get going here with uh, the impact report. This was one of those weeks where there was a lot of dumb stuff on the show, but I just don't care. <laughs> I I don't even care. I could not even begin to get mad at some of this uh, idiocy here. Maybe I should have. I don't know, but we'll go over it and we'll find out uh, whether I really loved or hated the show. All right, it uh, opened up. Where did it open up? Where's my report? Big Foley and Abyss came out. Where the fuck is my... Oh, there it is. Okay. Yeah, Foley and Abyss came out, and Foley had an eye patch on, because he got burned last week. He was lit on fire. Now, aside from being burned, he was totally fine. He had a... Uh... By the way, here's a fun drinking game for everybody. Watch this show with liquor and a shot glass. And every time someone in the promo says the words, You see, take a shot. Guaranteed you will be perhaps comatose by hour two. Your liver may actually try to escape your body. Foley does this promo about how Dixie Carter has clearly soured on him. So yes, she's now unabashedly a TV character. Said Raven and Stevie should have never messed with him. Tonight, in this very ring, they were going to have a tag match. Foley and Abyss versus Raven and Stevie. And uh, Stevie and Raven came out. And uh, Abyss is trying to stop Foley from doing this match, I guess, because Foley was hurt. So, Stevie makes some fire jokes, says it's Foley's own fault what happened because Foley tried to drive him out of TNA forever, which, if, for those of you that don't recall, last week it was a Loser Leaves Town match that they didn't talk about at all in commentary, and it was about three minutes long, but it's supposed to be a big deal, apparently. So, they uh, had Raven do a thing saying, Foley, you have no authority to sign this tag match tonight, and Foley said, yes, I did, or yes, I do, and then they played his music, and that was the end of the segment. This was uh, just a badly written pro wrestling segment. Foley actually said, he started talking about the fireball when Raven lit him a fire, and he said that as he was blinded, he had a moment of clarity, and he realized, that was when he realized that Dixie doesn't want him in TNA anymore. 
I defy anyone to logically, logically connect these two occurrences. <laughs> it's impossible. Somehow it happened. So also now he had to, even though the security at the impact zone knows who he is, he still needed to show them ID to get in. That has him upset. And he was going on and on about Hogan and uh, how he had not been notified of this signing. And when Raven finally comes out, he's like, I'm disappointed, Foley. You're more upset about Hulk Hogan coming in than the fact that I lit you on fire. And he has a point. He has an excellent point. And then Foley just said the match is on, and I had no idea if it was a tag match, a one-on-one match, a handicap match, or anything. He said the match is on. Vince Russo is like the worst storyteller there's ever been. I know I've said this a million times, but if he like took an average book and just randomly tore out, let's just say it's a 100-page book, just randomly tear out like 30 pages... You've got a Vince Russo wrestling show. That's exactly what this is. Why is Foley all of a sudden thinking that Dixie Carter wants him out of TNA? I mean, this makes absolutely no sense. There is literally no reason for this man to think this. But now it's just part of the story. Yeah. So Mike Denae said that they had sent a, they've been promising a Sting interview for weeks about Hogan's arrival in TNA and his retirement and other matters. And he had sent a crew to California to interview Sting's house, and, well, you have to stick around to see what happens. Yeah. Remember this, everyone. This was a tease. Barash interviews Kurt and AJ, who apparently are friends now, even though they just wrestled and Angle was a heel like three weeks ago. AJ cuts a promo on Daniels, saying he should have known that when he won the title, it was the beginning of the end of their friendship. And he said if Daniels wanted a shot at his title at final resolution, he needed to consider something more important, such as whether he'd make it through tonight's tag match which apparently was going to be Angle and AJ against Daniels and someone. But, of course, it's TNA, so very little mention of, was made of who their opponents were until the end of this segment. So Angle wants to know why Daniels was getting a shot at the pay-per-view. And AJ's like, well, what do you want me to do? Back down from a challenge? So so he's backing down from Kurt's challenge. Well, hold on. So he says, what do you want me to do? Back down from a challenge? And so Angle's like... All right, well, I challenge you. And so AJ's like, well, I'd love to get in the ring with you anytime, anywhere. And Borash is like, come on, guys, you need a team together tonight. And so then they just all walked off. <laughs> Angle didn't press the matter. No. AJ didn't do a good job explaining why he wasn't going to give Angle a rematch. Uh-uh. They both came off looking like fools. Yeah. I also like when the, int- the, the, the promo begins and Borash says, you know... Desmond Wolf claims that Kurt Angle didn't beat him. He chose to fight another day, and Daniel says AJ didn't pin him. And I thought, shouldn't Nigel McGuinness and Chris Daniels be here speaking for themselves? I guess not. No. I guess Boris is their new spokesman. So, yeah, Kurt issued a challenge. AJ said, I can't back down from a challenge to accept your challenge, so I'm backing down from your challenge. And uh, then they all left. This was stupid. And, there, and again, we were left with tag team partners who hate each other. Scott Steiner and Red. What the fuck was this match? Steiner had Crystal's face airbrushed on his crotch. Don West was outside. They have now put him on a mic so you can hear everything he yells to Red. Talk about just, I don't know. You're you're trying too hard at this point. So Don starts screaming that this is not fair because Steiner is so big and Red is so small. Mm Mm-hmm. And he says, and this is an exact quote, if he wants to make it for real, he needs to get himself in the X division. This is what Don says. What in the hell does that mean? Is this like Evolve Wrestling where you have to (laughs) register for whatever division you're in? an invitation. Can someone please explain to me what that means? He has to get in the division in order to have a shot. It's a non-title match, by the way. So Don is out there telling Red, it's not worth it. Hell of a babyface manager all of a sudden. So Steiner just destroys Red. Just fucking destroys the guy. And hits the Steiner square driver. And then goes outside, grabs the X title, grabs a pipe, and begins beating Red repeatedly for the disqualification. They buried Red so deep beneath the earth in this segment. It is 2009. And Vince Russo, after all these years, is still this fucking stupid. Uh Uh-huh. This was the dumbest thing I have seen since the heyday of Nitro. Not only that. Just throw this Dex title in the garbage. Exactly. This he, was retarded. He couldn't have done this to Kiyoshi or the Sheik or Consequences Creed. No. He had to do this to the X-Division champion. Yeah. In effect, he did this to 
Kiyoshi and the Sheik and Consequence of Creed and Jay Lethal. Now they're all going to be chasing after a dead belt. Yeah. Amazing. Oh, God. Mike Tanay was talking about the Scott Steiner Bobby Lashley match in the pay-per-view. Called it very controversial. <laughs> in what in way? In what way? Scott Steiner beat the fuck out of him, hit him with a pipe, and pinned him. Yes. Why? Where is the contra? Uh, that's the only match in TNA where there is no controversy. Actually, this is one of those. This is one of those those uh, shoot angles because it was controversial that they beat Lashley so clean. I see. Yeah. Are you being serious right now? I can't tell. I I don't know. Maybe. Don't either. I have no idea anymore. So yes, yeah, so, uh, not only did Don say that uh, Scott Steiner needed to get himself in the X division. He outright said, there is no reason for this match. And I thought, you're right. And he said, this is not right. And I said, no, no, it isn't. And then Steiner just utterly killed him. Yeah. Just, just, really, Rich does not show up anymore. There's no benefit to him being a teenager. No, he may as well quit. So, yeah, this, I can't even say it sucked. Because it was, it was, it was, Vince Russo is the Tiffany of Booker's. Yeah. And then he's in this point, since he was consistently entertainingly bad. This is the opposite of how to do wrestling, and it made me laugh. Nash is backstage with Eric Young in the Legends title. Nash is standing there with the belt, and Eric is standing next to him, looking at him like a nervous eight year old child who's about to get yelled at by his dad. Awesome. So Nash does this promo and he hands the title to Eric and he says At Bound for Glory, Eric, you did something few people have done in this business, and that's outsmart the smartest man in wrestling. He said he was so pissed off at Eric that he wanted to kill him, but then he thought, if Eric can get this reaction out of me, I want a team with this man. So he asked if he would be a team after comparing Eric to Scott Hall, and Eric goes, well, I'm going to have to think about that for a while, I'll do it. Pretty much exactly like I just said it yeah, right actually, there. Yeah, actually, yes. So Nash added that he was going to get on the phone with Hulk, and he said he would have some answers for Mick by the end of the night. So, yes, that's right. That's how they explained it. Nash got so mad at Eric that he liked him. That's what he said. I know. I know. I know. Yeah, we had Nash and Young here. Sadly, there's no Crosby and Stills in DNA to make a foursome out of this. But uh, I, I think he was actually comparing Young to Shawn Michaels, which I've seen Eric Young. I love Eric Young. This is a bad comparison. I just heard mullet, and that could have been any of 80 guys. <laughs> there were a lot of mullets to go around, so... Yes, the story is that he thought Eric outsmarted him, and thus he should be in charge, I suppose. So Nash says, "Are you cool that I'm not American, or uh, that I'm that I'm? Uh, are you cool that I am American?" And Young says, "Are you cool that you're from Detroit?" And Nash says, "I moved." And somehow this answered all their questions. Okay. Yeah. So now they are pals. Beer money and the Motor City Machine Guns against the British Invasion, the Mad Sheik, and Kiyoshi. With Eric Young and Nash doing commentary. And by the way, when they did that interview, they never mentioned what happened at Bound for Glory. Only that Eric made Nash really mad at Bound for Glory. So if you didn't buy Bound for Glory, and I can barely remember what happened, but I think Eric screwed him out of the title or something like that. As I recall... You, you can't just yeah. explain that in the interview. I mean, seriously. Just, they can. They're TNA. So they have You're this, right. You're right. But I, just, no one cares. They have this match. Eric Young and Nash are out there doing commentary. And the ref tells Eric that if you even get up out of that chair, World Elite will be DQ'd. So remember this. They have a little TV match. Hills get the heat on Shelly. Saban gets a hot tag. And then suddenly, Rob Terry, who's like the most jacked up guy in all of TNA, except for maybe Steiner. Rob I don't know. Terry, I think he's bigger. Rob Terry hits the ring right in front of the referee. Now, Eric Young can't even get out of his chair or he'll be DQ'd. But Rob Terry hitting the ring is perfectly fine. So he hits the ring and... Uh, and runs actually tries to do something, and anyway, he screws up, and the guys ended up doubling on Magnus and pinning him, and the match was fine. I uh, I think Magnus actually deserves some sort of award for the most improved guy of the past year or so. Quite possible. He's he's, he's pretty been good, perfectly acceptable professional wrestler at this point, and he was not when he started. So uh, way to go, Brutus Magnus. Yeah, the uh, World Elite were all mad at Big Rob afterwards, which was funny for two reasons. First of all, it implies that at some point, he's going to turn on them, and he will be Big Rob Singles Babyface. That's terrifying. Second of all, I love that they had this match here, and granted it was you know, an impact match, it went four minutes, but they're blaming the guy who was not involved and ran in and screwed up one spot instead of the four guys who screwed things up for four minutes. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful. 
I guess it makes sense with the bad guys, but it's just stupid. Foley met with Nash, and he said, listen, everyone knows you're Hogan's boy. And Nash is like, I haven't been anyone's boy since my dad died. And Foley's like, well, that's pretty heavy. And Nash says, quit being so paranoid. Hulk is here for business and business only. Nash? This is another awesome moment. Nash then says, I got suspended for two weeks without pay, and now I'm broke. Mm-mm. Kevin Nash was suspended for two weeks without pay, and now he's broke. Out of money were his exact words. I'm out of money. So, poor financial planning. Not only that, Nash was suspended, you say. Tell me more. <laughs> Tell me anything. Since right. fucking when I, was Kevin Nash suspended in storyline? You no, know, I... I don't think I do remember that, actually. He never I, was. When they told me he was suspended, I just believed them. This is... I'm now... No, here's the deal. He was suspended because of the deal where Chris Sabin ended up being dropped on his head, and Nash came out in front of the fans and yelled at TNA for not stopping the match. Oh, uh, that's right. And they suspended him for two weeks without pay. But none of that was ever explained on camera. Exactly! Which is why I didn't remember. Monumental, this was. So, he says... Foley, if you can get me my money from the last two weeks, which apparently is going to get Nash out of financial disarray. <laughs> out of despair. He will uh, poverty. He will get the information from Hulk Hogan and tell Foley about it. What information? I don't fucking know. But he's going to get it. <laughs> this, this, this happened. In between these last two segments, by the way, the, the eight-man tag and then this. First there was the eight-man tag, then a commercial, then they came back to Taz and Tanae, who were sitting at the announce desk confused. They talked about Foley or Nash or something, and then they went to commercials again. Actually, they've been doing this a lot on uh, all the Spike shows, actually, because they do it on Ultimate Fighter. It's it's a way to try to make you not skip the commercials. Mm. They'll do, like, two commercials, and then they'll do, like, a 15-second segment, and then back to commercials again. I see. Yeah. They did it last night. Kimbo was talking about something. I, I have noticed, actually, they've been doing an Ultimate Fighter all season. And the camera just inexplicably zoomed in on his bicep curling. And then they went back to, like, a, an Audi commercial or something. He was discussing his torn bicep and how he, I guess, he never got it fixed because there's still a lump at the end of his arm. Yeah. So so then we had Abyss meeting with Foley, and he's pleading with him not to endanger his career by working tonight. And Mick's laughing and cackling, then flips out and says, what happened last week was not funny at all, and that's why the match is tonight. And I just love that Abyss was the voice of reason. The here. monster Abyss. Yeah. Abyss is telling Foley, don't do something dumb. He's trying to rationalize with him. Yeah, good one. This is a preface. They aired a segment of Hulk Hogan meeting with a long line of fans. Actually, Which, that's later. No, maybe it's not. They did a few of them. Mm -hmm. This one in particular, all these fans said they were no longer watching Monday nights. They're going to watch Thursday nights. So we're supposed to believe these fans are cool. Meanwhile, the guy saying this is wearing a Def Leppard t-shirt. <laughs> I love Def Leppard, but come on now. And then there was another one, a grown man with a mustache just doing a Hulk Hogan impression. And remember that time they emptied out the impact zone and suddenly it all made sense? Yeah. More of the same. Yeah. More of the same. Got a Amada taylor Wild match. They put a ton of makeup on Hamada this week. And they only went about three minutes, but this was the best women's TV match in a long-ass time. And Hamada pinned her clean with the Hamada driver. I enjoyed this immensely. Indeed. It was a very good X Division style match where the whole thing was, you know, spot, 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 finish. But they did a very good job of it. So there you go. Then we got the Hogan interview, taped interview, where he says, This is the biggest move I've ever made, brother. And TNA is where the wrestling business is going to rest its hat. And then he concludes, and I quote, You can bank on it. Everybody listen to me. Do not bank on this. Save your fucking money. Sure. Yeah. Listen to Meredith Whitney. Do not listen to Hulk Hogan. So Abyss tries to block Foley's door with stuff to prevent him from coming to the ring. He, he threw a desk in the way. Yeah. And okay. this worked, by the way, for a while. It Well, <laughs> it worked. Actually, we'll get to that in a minute. It worked. It, he blocked Foley in from his office, and Foley could not escape. So he blocks his door, and, and uh, then we get another awesome TNA moment. Stevie and Raven come out for the tag match. Abyss comes out alone. It's a handicap match. And Abyss is selling. He makes a one-man comeback. Raven then pulls out a lighter, I guess, to burn Abyss. Abyss kicks the lighter out of his hand. The lighter lands in the middle of the ring. 
The ref sees the lighter on the mat and calls for a DQ. Because you see, first off, a fan could not have thrown that lighter in. He didn't see who threw the lighter or who had it. He just saw a lighter on the mat and he called for the bell. I want to know why a lighter on the mat is a bigger infraction than Rob Terry hitting the ring. But it is. So they call for the bell. The heels attack Abyss. They proceed to wrap thick cables around his neck. They proceed to hang him from the ring ropes. And as the Lord Almighty is my witness, Mike Tanay screams, and I quote, They are choking the life out of Abyss. And no sooner does he say this than, of course, they cut to commercial. Mm -hmm. So they cut to commercial as Abyss is being hanged to death. They come back, and there's a segment with ODB. <laughs> there is no follow-up? No, we, they did not then then go to the ring to see Abyss being treated. No. Is Abyss dead? <laughs> Was the know. life choked out of him? Is he still hanging there? Is he hurt? I have no idea. We have no clue. We never saw Abyss again on this show. <laughs> they choked him until he disappeared. We do, however, have an ODB. We had... Interviewing Homicide. This was... I thought the return of ODB's angle. I guess technically that's not true, since it's now called Trash Talk with ODB. I think it always was. You're thinking Karen's angle. When she started, she just stole the name. I see. I do not blame you for not remembering that. I wish, no. I, I, wish I could write it out from my memory. It was the same thing. Really? This was like public access. In fact, I can't even say that. I was on public access. I used to watch a lot of the shows. This was worse. This was junior high kids goofing off with a camera in the cafeteria. Yeah, drinking. For sure. Like junior high. ODB is there. She interviews Homicide. He briefly, like for eight seconds, talks about suicide, who he's feuding with. And then they proceed to start banging their asses together and dancing and rolling around and, and shimmying. And then it immediately cuts away. <laughs> no. I will say the last five seconds of this was amazingly entertaining TV. I don't know what the fuck it was. I have no idea. I, it may have disproven my theory that Dancing Wrestlers is always entertaining. Yeah. But uh, it was wacky. It was... I don't know. I, I guess if you love ODB, you will love these segments. I look at ODB, and I'm usually just bewildered. So I don't want to see her more often. But if you do, then hey. It gets better. Here she is. They cut away, and they come back, and Lauren is interviewing Tomko. Yeah, he's back. Just like that. As this she, was his big return. As she said, after a lengthy absence, Tomko, welcome back to TNA. And this is his return about an hour 20 into the show, an unannounced promo. Yeah. And what did he have to say? Well, he said, I'm going to step up and show everyone what I should have showed you the first time. Then he left. You know, when he sucked. <laughs> he said this, and he backed up, and he walked off the set. That's the last we ever saw of him on this program. So... And by the way, I don't, think he, I don't think he appeared on any of the next two tapings, either. So awesome. So that's even better. So the beautiful people walk in. They... I'm just going to read what I wrote. If you want to go farther, you may. I bet your notes are better than mine. No. Beautiful people walked in and proceeded to bury her. Well, do I really need to explain it? I do want to point out that someone in here said that what had just happened was a great interview. I hope it was Lauren who actually thought she had pulled off a great interview. It was. She goes, thanks for interrupting another great interview. Yes. And that was already over. So, yes, the beautiful people were themselves. They were, in fact, better interviewers than Lauren, and then they left. Then we had... Where am I? AJ doing a promo, a tape promo. This, if, if if I ever write Death of TNA and there's ever an audio book, it's going to open with this clip. AJ says, Hulk Hogan coming to TNA is the most positive change imaginable. And everything Hulk Hogan touches turns to gold. <laughs> that was awesome. He really said this. Perhaps he didn't hear the story about how uh, he cannot, George Foreman got the grill and Hogan got whatever he got. Possibly believe this. Alyssa Flash and Sarita... Alyssa is now wearing a zip-up leather jacket. She teases zipping it down and then zips it right back up. So they Over just, and over and over and over again. It was too much. Did some uh, lucha early. It didn't work. And then Alyssa cut her off and beat her up. And then Sarita makes a comeback, do some near falls. And then Sarita just kicks her in the head and pins her clean. Sure. Now, this would be fine if not for the fact that last week they began building up a feud between uh, Alyssa Flash and Tracy... And immediately after Alyssa Flash gets pinned, Tracy runs down and starts beating her up. Why the fuck should we care about these two losers? <laughs> I don't. I really, truly don't. So uh, I, I guess the answer is they're not supposed to. 
They don't want you to care. Hmm. I don't know. I, I don't have a good answer for that. I thought earlier, because Taylor Wilde got pinned by Hamada, I thought, okay, that's one half of the tag chance being pinned here. I thought, you know, Sarita be pinned, and then you'd have, you know, two two girls with singles wins over the tag champion, so then they'd do that tag feud. But Maybe no. You're, come on now. Stop trying to book. Foley was looking for Raven, and Daphne distracted him. How did he get out of his office? Well, that's the other part of the question. <laughs> he was trapped in his office, and suddenly he's out free. I was hoping it would be like the big Lebowski, where they, they hammered that thing, and put the or the, the dude hammers a little thing into the ground and puts a chair in front of the door, and, of course, the door opens the other way, so the chair just falls down. I wish he would have done that, and all this stuff would have fallen on Mick, and then he would have crawled out of the rubble. But anyway, so he's looking for Raven, and Daphne distracts him. They jump him. They start choking him with the cord. And as they're choking him with the cord, they cut to commercial. They come back. No follow-up. Oh. I have no idea how full he is. I have no idea how Abyss is. I have no idea if they're dead, alive, hurt, hospitalized. I have no fucking idea. No, this time we never saw any of these men again. No. So, Okay. Rhino Team 3D against Hernandez, Matt Morgan, and the Pope in a street fight. And Pope street clothes, by the way, include sunglasses. Hit each other with a bunch of gizmos. The Pope was a superstar in this match. Oh, God, yes. In terms of his work, his charisma, he was awesome. If I ever again say there's no good reason to watch TNA and you say the Pope, I say you got me there. Yeah. That's the argument. Huge flying elbow, and then he demanded Hernandez and Morgan get the tables. And they did a bunch of stuff. And Bubba and Devon ended up hitting the 3D on Pope. He rolls outside. Hernandez spears Rhino, goes for the cover. Someone pulls the ref out of the ring. And suddenly, of all people, Jesse Neal hits the ring, hits Hernandez with a chair. Rhino gets the pin. And by the way, for those of you that have no idea what happened to this match, go ahead and join the club. It's just an overbooked clusterfuck. But it was fun. It was a fun overbooked clusterfuck. I enjoyed this. Yeah. And mostly because of Pope. Bubba Ray was hysterical in a good way. Yeah. And uh, there was constant action, a lot of cool, a lot of cool shit going on. Can't deny it. And then a strange man with a wacky haircut came in. Jesse Neal is clearly no longer in the Navy. He's now got <laughs> a gigantic mohawk, tats everywhere, piercings, yeah, you know, facial hair. And they did a promo after the match with Team 3D and Rhino and Jesse. And Bubba's basically plugging to school, saying, "This is what you get when you train with Team 3D. Yeah, a douchebag haircut." Said Jesse was the true future of TNA, not Morgan or Hernandez. And Jesse plugged the school and vowed to be the best. And this was like an awesome old school yeah. heel faction promo. This th- this promo would have fit right in in the good old days of OVW. Just just wacky heels being over the top, wacky and evil. Just Jesse Neal has clearly been trained by Rhino on how to cut a promo. Because he growls the entire time, but then when he stopped speaking, he still just growled and made faces the entire time because he's so intense. You know what has the advanced archers intense in ECW? That's bullshit. Jesse Neal, intense. He was intense. And then... I'm a huge fan of Team 3D lately. They, they, all year. Their promos have been awesome. Mm. And, and I don't know if it's maybe... Uh, this may be my bad memory, but I, I always remember as Bubba Ray being the talker and Devon would say, Oh, my brother, testify. When Devon speaks, he's great. He's a great interview. He was fucking great here. Yeah. And they were all cackling at each other and laughing and having a good old time. This was the best promo I have I've seen in years. I, <laughs> all four of these men must be just like this in every show. Danae then announced that they had gone to Sting's house to interview him. Remember, everyone, they teased this. Yeah. They teased this. Stick around to see what happened at Sting's house. So we wait an hour and a half, and they announced that they went to Sting's house to interview him, and he no-showed. And they had a guy sitting in, they had two director's chairs set up, and a light guy and a camera guy, and I guess the interview guy in one of the chairs, and he shook his head and stood up and lifted up his hands, and that was the end. Yeah, as if they said, guys, act like Sting is not there. Yes. That's exactly what they did. And by the way, how do you no-show your own home? I don't know. Did they bother going up and ringing the doorbell? Or did they just sit outside like dumb shits, hoping he'd just come out and grant them an interview. And who was going to interview him? That guy. Just a random guy? There there was a guy sitting, he had shoulder-length black hair, he was sitting in the back of the camera, I thought, is is that Sting? He stood up, this is not Sting. But I don't know what happened. They interviewed Daniels and Nigel about the match tonight, and the keys to the segment were that Daniels said AJ couldn't beat him, and he deserved a one-on-one shot, and Nigel said we were wankers. We had a Body by Jake commercial, and if you order one, they said, you can have Randy Couture's insane 11-minute workout. Wow. I'm not aware that Randy Couture worked out for 11 minutes a day. Wow. I guess I'm doing something wrong. Well, you don't want to overtrain when you're 46. I suppose that's true. 
got to know your limits. At 50, it may drop to 10 minutes. No, I'm not sure that's the word I got. Then we had Angle and AJ against Desmond and Daniels. And the story was that Daniels didn't want to work with AJ, and Desmond didn't want to work with Angle. But, of course, then the heels got the heat, and they beat the crap out of Angle. And AJ got the hot tag, ran wild on Wolfie. Daniels cut him off, Tower of London. AJ kicked out. And, again, it would probably be best if you let the guy win some mo- matches with his move. Yeah. Get the move over before dudes start kicking out of the move. You would think. I mean, this is just basic wrestling 101, but... I guess Russo took, like, the remedial wrestling booking class or something like that and failed. So, anyway, ends up with Angle chasing Wolfie to the back. Daniels hit AJ with the BME, pinned him, and it was actually a really good main event. Great booking, believe it or not, with uh, Daniels pinning AJ to set up a title shot that he promised he could get. And uh, mind-boggling, having watched the rest of the show, that the ending could have been so good. It was even... Obviously, AJ Styles, sh- or rather, nobody should be kicking out of Nigel's finishers this early, but... The fact remains, Nigel incapacitated AJ with his finisher. Granted, AJ kicked out, but then Nigel Nigel bailed, and suddenly Daniels sprung into action, had AJ prone, and then hit his finisher and won. So, I was going to say it got Beth both men over, but really, uh, Wolfie is still where he was before. But it got Daniels over. He pinned the champion going into a title match with his finisher, clean in the middle of the ring. So, yes, good job, TNA. Would have been better if you had, you know, there's 8 million ref bumps and whatever on the show, but here you had to have AJ kick out of Nigel's finisher. But what can you do? To the back! All right, Impact. They now say Thanksgiving Championship Series. Okay. <laughs> this is one of those moments where I think, okay, they have to listen to the Brian and Vinny show. There's just no way around it. Because they abbreviated it as the TCS which was the name that we gave Todd Grisham for years, that cocksucker, after his commentary on the Benoit DVD, for those of you that recall. So, yeah, the TCS, they call it. On the bright side, they actually had brackets. Now, would you like me to tell you what TCS, where they actually got the TCS ID, idea? Sports, I'm sure. It is a sports reference. I don't care. Okay. We had, uh, we had Abyss versus Lashley, Wolfie versus Suicide, Angle against the Pope, and Homicide versus Rude. By the way, take a guy off the street who doesn't watch pro wrestling and say, there's going to be a tournament tonight, and it's going to feature Homicide, The Pope, Suicide, and Abyss. What did that man say? I don't care. (laughs) How ridiculous. What stupid names. All right, so anyway, I actually have zero complaints about this so far. They had brackets. They announced a tournament, so I was happy. We had Abyss against Lashley. Crystal was down there with Bobby, and at first I thought, I'm glad they learned a lesson from when Scott Steiner stalked her the last few weeks. And then I suddenly recalled, last week on this very show, did Scott Steiner not go into Lashley and Crystal's hotel room and beat the holy living hell out of Lashley with accoutrements? Did that not happen? It did. There was absolutely no Video package? That may have been two no weeks ago. Mention, I'm not sure. No follow-up? Nothing to this angle. Are you sure that wasn't before the last pay-per-view? Let me think about this. I don't think it was last week. When was the last pay-per-view? Well, let me see if it was last week. Very easy to find out. I write a newsletter, you see. Yeah. Regardless, they're, they're wrestling again on the next pay-per-view, aren't they? Are they? I don't know. I'm almost positive they are. This review I think sucks. it's a straight match on the next pay-per-view. That's the way it usually works in this company. I'm going to find all this out right now. Yeah, they had the rest of the pay-per-view, and then last, or Steiner hit him with a pipe and pinned him clean. That's right. So I think that was before that. All right. Lash, uh, we had Scott Steiner versus Red. Lashley ran down and chased Steiner away. This was last week. Okay, that was probably the last we saw of them. Then. That was their only appearance on the show. All right. Well, let's look at uh, TNA Wrestling and uh, see. I'm almost, I'm almost 100% positive they're wrestling on the next pay-per-view. Which makes this even more just mind-boggling. All right, pay-per-view. Turning. All they have are results. They're not promoting anything? A year of conflict. A year. Shut up. All right, current lineup for Turning Point. We just watched Turning Point, didn't we? I could have sworn we just watched Turning Point. Uh, Final resolution, I'm sorry. I see. Daniels versus AJ, Tara versus ODB, and Feast or Fired. I'm almost... Fucking positive. 
What better place to check than uh, Wikipedia? Yeah. Let's see what they have listed. Final resolution. 2009. I always love how Wikipedia describes pay-per-views as well. I'm going to just read the first line here. Final Resolution 2009 is an upcoming professional wrestling pay-per-view event produced by the Total Nonstop Action Wrestling Promotion, which will take place on December 20th, 2009 at the TNA Impact Zone in Orlando, Florida. It will be the sixth under the Final Resolution chronology. Final Resolution will feature an undetermined number of professional wrestling matches that will involve different wrestlers from pre-existing scripted feuds and storylines. Wrestlers will be portrayed as villains, heroes, or less distinguishable characters in these scripted events that build tension and culminate into a wrestling match or series of matches. That is the theory. Awesome. No, they only have the same three matches as listed on the uh, main page. All right, anyway. I'll bet you anything, Lashley. So, Abyss wrestled Lashley. Yeah. I'm just trying to find something to nitpick here at this point. (laughs) Abyss, well, I will say this is the worst match in the show. Uh, There was a point here where Abyss had the heat on Lashley, and in the middle of the ring here he applied a neck crank. All I can think was, boy, they take the weapons away from you, and you just become worthless, don't you? So then they're brawling outside, and uh, they're brawling on the floor, and Crystal comes running up to do, I have no idea what, was going to jump between these two monsters. And Abyss is like throwing a punch, and on the backswing, his elbow catches Crystal, and she tumbles to the floor and immediately starts sh- selling her ankle. However, she was behind Abyss. Yeah, she got hit in the face and sold her ankle. Yeah. So... Abyss has no idea what this happened, even. Uh, they brawl back inside. He throws Lashley in. He's Then he sees Crystal on the floor, and she's hurt. And somehow he, it occurs to him, even though he didn't know he had even hit her, he suddenly realized this is somehow his fault. He's appalled. He is horrified. And he turns around, and he is speared. And then Lashley, I, I think, has the Dragon Sleeper in front of the one, right? Yeah. Yeah. So that was that. At the, as soon as the decision was announced, Crystal began jumping up and down. Then remembered to sell her foot, and then got in the ring. So, I don't know what happened here. No one knows. I don't know. It was Let's just, just move on. I don't know why Chris, uh, Chris, why Chris Abyss couldn't just lose to Lashley. I well, there are a lot of questions here. Borash met with Foley, especially since Lashley's going to win the goddamn tournament. You would think, yes, he couldn't just have Lashley beat him. Let me give a tip to all aspiring bookers out there. If you're going to have a tournament, and you're going to have a guy win, and the idea is that you want to get that guy over, all his matches need to end clean. Lashley, we'll, we'll, we'll keep going. We're just going to get through all of these here. So anyway, Lashley's first match, fuck finish. Then we had Borash meeting with Foley, and he's still upset that Hogan got brought in, and nobody bothered to tell him. He said even Bubba the Love Sponge and all of his listeners heard before he did. And he said, I'm the executive shareholder. I should have been better informed. He is actually correct about that. (laughs) I will give him that. So, Borash then said he was being too obsessive, and Foley said he was going to go talk to Kurt. Well, it was funny, because about being obsessive, and he is sitting there worried about Hulk Hogan. Never once on this in this promo or on the show did he reference that he was wearing an eye patch because Raven set him on fire. Or the last week, last week time we saw him, Raven had tried to kill him via hanging. Yeah, we never got a follow-up to There's that. There's no Abyss. reference to that at all. Yeah. Foley is more worried about Hulk Hogan. And you know what? I had completely forgotten about that, Borash by the way. is right. Foley is obsessed. Wolfie McGee and Suicide. And by the way, they explained that the winner of the tournament got a title shot in the division they normally compete in. Mm-hmm. Therefore, if Suicide wins, he only gets an X division shot. He gets a shot at Red, who Steiner killed last week. He can't even get a shot at the world title, apparently, no. if he wants it. He cannot choose which side he wants, no. So, we had this match, and Wolfie botched at Tower of London for the pin. I didn't even know how he did it, but it was just botched. And, good match, no running, I have zero complaints. Except for what you just said about his botch finish. Well, it's not a really complaint. It just it's happened. It, 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 it is funny in that we've been begging them to let him actually beat men with his moves, and then when they finally do, it got fucked up. Yeah. And because of his impact, they cannot reshoot or re-edit it in any way. No. Pope and Kurt Angle. I want to mention something about Angle, by the way. The next guy that says that Kurt Angle looks like he's on death's door, I'm going to throttle. Listen, everybody. Kurt Angle used to massively tan every day, which, I hate to tell you, ain't healthy. Kurt Angle, to get up to 250 pounds of solid muscle, was taking a number of different chemicals. 
He was busted with these chemicals. He has admitted to taking these chemicals. I'm not saying anything that is it is a mystery. So now he's probably the closest to clean he's been since the Olympics. He's not in the tanning bed every day. And everybody's like, my God, he looks like he's about to die. No, he's probably the healthiest he has been in years, aside from his neck injury. So anyway, they have this match here, and it's actually really good. And ends up with uh, everyone kicking out of a bunch of uh, moves, and then Angle hit the Olympic Slam for the pin. And very good. It was no complaints. Damn good. Absolutely no complaints here. Pope got treated like a major star. He had his whole entrance. People were totally into him. They totally bought the idea that he may pin Kurt Angle at any point. He was given everything. The only They don't have a lot of time, only about five minutes or so, but it was about as great a five-minute TV match as you'll see this year. The fans chanted, this is awesome. I agreed. They embraced. All was right with the world. This was a great fucking segment. Foley met with Angle about the Hogan thing. Wanted to know what was going on. Angle said Dixie and Hogan had partnered up to take the show to new heights. And Mick's like, you're on board? Angle said, yes, of course I am. And Foley said, well, I hope the guy that Hogan is bringing with him is on board. I'm thinking, wouldn't he by design be on board if he's the guy Hogan is bringing in? You would think. So anyway, Angle's like, where did you hear about this other guy? And Foley said, Nash told me. And Angle said, don't listen to that fool. That was that. Robert Roode and Homicide. They had a uh, fun little match here. And uh, it's quick. Traded a bunch of finisher attempts. And then after trading a bunch of finisher attempts, Robert Roode hits a spine buster for the pin. Right. Oh, well. I guess it's a finisher now. So, round two ends up Lashley and Wolf, Root and Angle, and then TNA can't do a single segment sometimes without something goofy happening. Or at least they can't do a full show. Homicide goes nuts after the match and suddenly threatens, quote, our assistant producer Stevie, who is not Stevie Richards, it's just a random woman. So, again, I love how TNA every now and then just introduces people we've never seen into the show. And we're supposed to care. Yeah. Who gives a fuck he could if have he threatened, a, threatened a random woman? Or SoCal Val or Warren. No. A woman we've never seen before. Never. And now we've seen her we will never see again. Yeah. I also, and I love Homicide, but he opened the match by attacking Robert Roode and just physically overwhelming him. Homicide is small. Yeah. Robert Roode's not large, but he's bigger than Homicide. And uh, it looks kind of silly. Borash interviewed Kurt about the big win, and he talked about how he had a lot of respect for Rude, but he had his eye on the prize. That was a title match against AJ, and he said he hoped Wolfie made it to the finals because getting a title shot by beating him would be the best thing possible. Good interview. We had a women's battle royal. Hamada, Daphne, Alyssa Flash, Tracy, the beautiful people, Sarita, Tara, Taylor Wilde. Now, for those people that think that I am completely unfair on TNA, first off, fuck off. Second off, this was so much better than the Raw Battle Royal on Monday, and it involved all of the TNA women. These chicks work their asses off. So, ended up with a whole bunch of eliminations, and it came down to Madison, Velvet, and Tara. And, of course, Madison and Velvet are on the same team. The place was going nuts for the last couple of minutes of this match. Velvet accidentally eliminated her partner, and then Tara tossed her out for the win, and this match was fucking fun. We were now an hour into the show, and it was great. I was waiting for Doom. It, indeed, and uh, it, it helped that this was fun because it was very fast for a battle royal, and most battle royals you will see eight guys basically grabbing headlocks and standing there. This one, there was eight or nine girls in there, and there was something going on pretty much all the time. Literally from the get-go, when the bell rang, and Hamada just grabbed Daphne and deposited her on the floor. As if to say, you do not belong here. And that made me laugh. And other than that, it was just boom, 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 action, action, action. They got to the point. Then it got down to two on one. The easiest story in the world to tell. And the one girl beat two. Everyone cheered. Everyone was happy. She had, I guess, a face-off with ODB. It's hard to tell what ODB is ever doing, but that's what they did. And so now she has a title shot. Yeehaw! Borash wanted to know why Eric's global championship wasn't on the line in the tournament. And who would want a shot? Was my question. <laughs> that's, a one, que- that's question one. So he reiterated that he would never be defending the title in America or against an American. Again, 
Okay. Why is Eric allowed to make these rules? Don't know. Why doesn't AJ Styles just say, I will never defend this championship against an earthling? Why? <laughs> Why? The only thing I can think of is that, again, Eric's title started out as Booker T's toy belt. So maybe... But then it became an official championship. Maybe it, maybe it wasn't, though. Maybe they just lied to all the wrestlers. Do you have a better explanation? I'm trying to think of other things that AJ could say. I will never defend this title against a biped. A homo sapien. Who? I'm going to move on. Then we had the Steiner situation backstage, screaming at the seamstress to make a new main event mafia outfit. And Foley comes back. He says, I just talked to Kurt. And he alluded there was no more mafia. And Steiner was like, well, did he say there was no, or did he just allude to it? Foley said alluded. So then Steiner was happy, and he told her to keep making his outfit. <laughs> so he never said it. And he thrust both both his fists in the air, and he told, her, told the girl to put the mafia logo on his gear. And he was, this was the best example of blissful ignorance ever. Steiner, there's part of him that suspects the mafia may be dead, but he doesn't want to hear it. So he just avoids it, and that's great. Then we had a moment that, Boggles my mind. I have absolutely no idea what happened here. Steiner asks him, Who's the smartest person you know? I think Foley said Paul Heyman, but I'm not sure because they bleeped it. Right. This raises so many questions I could talk for hours. The first question would be, for example, Why did they bleep out this guy's name? Don't know. Did they script it to where Mick Foley answered Paul Heyman, and then at some point they realized, wait a second, this is stupid. And so instead of removing the segment... Or refilming it. Or reshooting it, they just bleeped out the name. This was this was like when people talk about TNA as low rent. I mean, this right here is just... This was so ghetto. <laughs> No, I can't because argue. there is no, there is no explanation that is not this company is incompetent. <laughs> yes. Like you could come up with any any explanation in the world, and there is not one that when you break it down, the the answer is not this company is incompetent. I do not see the crew sitting around writing out the segment saying, "Have fully say a name, and then we'll bleep it." If they do that, they're incompetent because it comes off looking so fucking stupid. I just I just pray that they film this with him saying Paul Heyman and then all of a sudden like days later someone went hey he doesn't that work is for us a stupid thing to for Why him to say Why should we promote someone who's not in our company Jesus we better bleep it out yeah, It would have been better though if they had just badly dubbed it in a voice like he said, they said who's the smartest guy you think of and he just says Dixie Carter God So and by the way Foley uh, told Steiner that Nash had told him someone else was coming. And Scott goes, well, if Kevin said it, it's got to be true. Kevin doesn't lie. <laughs> awesome. So then they go to commercial, and they come back, and there's Foley again. And this was the moment where I officially decided I never need to see Mick Foley again. God bless the guy, and I don't mean never again. But if you took him off TV for six months, I'd be fine with that. This was the moment that he officially became overkill. He goes up to Nash and Eric, who are still standing in front of the curtain they did the interview in front of about 15 minutes ago. <laughs> they just never left. What the hell they're still doing there, I have no idea. So he starts talking about the two-week suspension, which, of course, was never mentioned on TV, which Nash wants his money back for, and fully trying to explain that he can't afford it, while also explaining earlier in the show that he's the executive shareholder of the company, which indicates that TNA does not, in fact, make any money at all. So... Foley wants Nash to tell him who else is coming in. They hem and haw forever. Nash won't answer. He does say, if Nobbs comes in, I'm quitting, which was funny. And then he told him, when Hulk gives me the info, Mick, I'll tell you. And thank God this was the last time we saw Foley on this show. This was an amazing segment. There was a point where they were debating who Hulk might bring with him. And uh, they started making a few insider jokes and references. And then... Nash, he, he later said Nobbs' name, but first, he just said, what about, and then, like, raised his armpit and charged Foley and screamed. And people were supposed to know, he must be talking about Brian Nobbs, 
who used to do that move in the 1990s. Yeah. Yeah. So then this segment ended, and I just... Crumbly may not have even been born. <laughs> I just want to remind people, this was the best impact of the year. Yeah. All right. So then we had Nigel and Lashley, second round match. This was... This may have been Lashley's best match in TNA. They had a really fun, awesome mat wrestling segment at the beginning. And uh, then we got the finish. Nigel puts him in the London dungeon in the ropes. The ref starts counting. Nigel is busy yelling that this is what's going to happen to you, Kurt. And he holds on too long and gets disqualified. So the announcers try to claim that Nigel is so obsessed with Kurt Angle that he didn't listen to the count. <laughs> so basically, he came off like a complete idiot. Yeah. And worse, he wasn't even mad afterwards. No, he just said oh, whatever. He calmly put on his jacket. He calmly put on his sunglasses. He happily walked to the back. And then he goes, Kurt, that's what's going to happen to you at the pay-per-view. And I thought, what? Kurt's going to win via disqualification <laughs> because you're a fucking idiot? <laughs> so This segment failed. To review a couple of things. Lashley's first two wins came when Abyss was distracted by Lashley's wife, and then when a guy was kicking his ass in the wrong area. Yeah. And then he was disqualified. So way to go, Lashley. The match was really fun because Bobby Lashley is A, terribly scary, and B, has a strong wrestling background. So... The gimmick was he just kept grabbing arm ringers, and Nigel would go for one of his funky reversals, and then Lashley would just, like, not go down. Like, <laughs> uh, Nigel would twist the arm around and go for, like, a back heel trip or something, and Lashley just wouldn't move and would just power him back into the arm ringer. Awesome. And so finally, Nigel just hit him with a back elbow for the heat. Also awesome. So it was really great. And then they did the finish, which was really stupid. And the other stupid thing I forgot to mention is if Nigel didn't care about winning and was willing to get disqualified to send a message to Kurt Angle... Why do you do it in the first round? Don't know. <laughs> and then they could have had a could have do Lashley kill suicide here. I don't know. Lauren interviewed Lashley about his win, but before he could speak, Crystal actually grabbed the mic and cut a promo about how whether it's TNA or MMA, nobody is stopping the boss. Tonight he's going to win the tournament and take the title. It was actually a pretty damn good promo. It was, fine. It was great. And the fact that they are having her cut promos for him... Yes. They have given up on Lashley. They have given up on Lashley already. And then already. he won the tournament, by the way. <laughs> and then he won the tournament. <laughs> they have given up on Lashley, but she did great. She had, like, one, one, two sentences, whatever it was. And really, this is what more promos need to be anyway. She, she, she is a manager who is a mouthpiece for a guy who can't talk. She made her point, and then it ended. Yeah. She was not left to kill time, and there was no awkward uh, moment of the camera staying on her after she was done. I was fine with this segment. Kurt Angle and Robert Roode, another good match, another stupid finish. They're training all these near falls, both guys kicking out, it's really fun. And Nigel comes out and spits on Kurt. Kurt leaves the ring and they start brawling at ringside. The referee is looking right there at a guy brawling with Kurt in the middle of a match. This is not a disqualification, no. He starts counting Kurt out. <laughs> yeah. I swear to God. <laughs> So, Kurt gets counted out for brawling with an illegal man in the Sear match and uh, wins as a result of that. So, it sucks to be Robert Roode. Where's Jesse Ventura? Because that's a fucking conspiracy right there. So, again, TNA finding a way to take something really good and make it stupid. I, I Nigel was, at, at various points, he was losing the brawl, and Kurt would turn around and Nigel would go, No, come on, Kurt, come on! And so Kurt would go beat him up more. So... The story is that Kurt is an idiot and Nigel is a pussy. And then the best part of all was Kurt turned around and started running for the ring way too early and then had to pretend he could not run fast enough to beat the count. And I know we've been over this before, but Kurt Angle is an amazing athlete, including great foot speed. But he had to jog halfway down there and not get in by 10. The match was really awesome. They worked their asses off. Yeah. And uh, and again, Angle gave Rude everything and, and, and made him look good, which is, you know, he's Robert Rude. That's not, a par, not hard to do. And it was just a really, really dumb finish. AJ came out and cut a promo. Said he hadn't heard from Sting in a while and asked him to please give him a call. And Daniels comes out. And uh, I, a while ago, was talking about AJ showing up at the building with his backpack. I recall. Which everybody freaked out about. Why does it matter? Blah, blah, blah. And by the way, when I go to Tulalip, my gear's in a backpack. Okay? I'm not the champion of the number two promotion that's in the fucking world, supposedly. At least in uh, the United States. AJ comes out in jeans and a t-shirt. 
with his generic short brown haircut, and he's got his world title belt. He looked like the champion of an indie promotion. Uh Okay, if that's what you want to be, fine. All right? If TNA has happy being an indie promotion, fine. I Hulk Hogan cannot watch this show. Because if Hulk Hogan watched the show and AJ Styles dressed like that, came out with the championship belt over his shoulder, Hogan's just got to be freaking out at this just absurdity. He looked like any fan with a replica belt who is in good shape. So worse, Chris Daniels comes out. He's got a nice red button-up shirt, a vest, slacks, nice shoes, sunglasses, shaved head, looking like a fucking superstar. And then he stood next to AJ, who looked like he found a great bargain on the TNA title at a garage sale. AJ looked like a guy in line for an autograph with... Chris Daniels. <laughs> Can you autograph my TNA belt, sir? Will you please sign my replica belt, sir? So they do this promo. I'm a big fan, Mr. Daniels. Daniels was awesome. And he cuts a promo about how he'd been a better friend to AJ than AJ had been for him. And he said he never got any title shots. He lost his job. AJ didn't use any of his stroke to get him back. Crowd was chanting, shut the hell up. And Daniels said, why should I shut up? Because I'm telling the truth. And he said that he had Joe pinned. AJ fucked it up for him. Sounds like Batista and Ray, by the way. But anyway, he said, that's why you wanted me to be your best friend, so I wouldn't be your worst enemy. And uh, Daniels was awesome. Daniels here. was awesome here. And if they had ended this promo here, it would have been like A-plus stuff. Instead, they had to give AJ kind of a rebuttal, which was basically, I'll beat you at the pay-per-view. And it was came off totally weak. And uh, not nearly as cool as Daniels, which was, I guess, the theme of this segment. But still, uh, as effective and good stuff, just because Chris Daniels is awesome. He was quite great. And uh, then that led us to Lauren interviewing Rude about the match with Lashley. He said that they were uh, going to separate the men from the boys. He wasn't only going out there for himself. He was going out for his partner. And they plugged a potential match with British Invasion to, I guess, tease that perhaps... Uh, that's the match we might get after this. Ended up with uh, Lashley and Rude, tournament finals. Match was good, but this was a match where, I mean, everybody knows, but it really hit me watching this match how vanilla Bobby Lashley is. I mean, God bless the guy, but his matches are fine. They're nothing special unless he's in with a really great worker. Badly lacking in charisma. Mm-hmm. Crystal is cutting promos for him, so... With all that said, he got the win out of nowhere with the spear. And the Lashley family is all happy afterwards. And they hugged. And then they raised his hand and the show went off the air. Why can't they do a show like this every week? Because as know. much as I made fun of a lot of stupid stuff on this show, and as always with TNA, there's stupid stuff. But still, this was the most fun I have had watching TNA in months and months and months. I seriously think this was the best impact of the year. Maybe, <laughs> it probably was! Maybe those who chart this kind of thing will go back and say, no, there was a show in February that was really awesome, and I'll look at the lineup and say, I remember that show, it was great, but as I sit here, I sincerely believe it was the best impact of the year. And it's funny, because we, uh, you know, we watched this show, it's Thanksgiving Day, I spent pretty much literally all day driving around and eating, and I didn't want any more any more substance in my body at all whatsoever for fear I may actually explode. And I know you think that I, you often think that I'm trying to eat myself until I explode. That's not my goal. And ordinarily, I watch Impact with alcohol. And I was not going to put anything else into my body tonight, for, again, for fear that I would, would explode. And I'm very happy about it because I got the best Impact of the year sober. Woohoo! Yeah. 